afternoon and welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education monthly meeting for September 7th. At this time, could I have a motion to go into closed session? Yes, as permitted by Section 3-305B of the General Provisions Article of the Annotated Code of Maryland, I move that we go into closed session to discuss personnel item, the superintendent search process, um, the appointment of that superintendent, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation or performance evaluation of employees, employees or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction, and other personnel matter that affects one or more individual, specific individuals. We will also be discussing collective bargaining and to review the HR report and the uh, meeting minutes from August 3rd and August 25th. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or concerns regarding the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote to go into closed session. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, the ayes have it. We will return at 6 o'clock. We'd like to welcome you to the Board of Education meeting this evening. This is a public meeting and it is being videotaped for citizens to review on QAC TV7, a local cable station. The agenda is available on the information table and during this meeting we ask that you would turn off your phones and or your cell phones, pagers, and keep your conversations to a minimum level or outside of the meeting room. At this time, we will stand and be led by the Pledge of Allegiance by our President, Jennifer George. Pledge of Allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening and thank you all for coming. Um, first thing on our agenda is, t is to approve it. So I need a motion to approve the agenda as presented. So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote to approve the agenda as presented. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Um, next on the agenda, I need an a make, um, I need a motion to approve the minutes of open and closed sessions from August 3rd and August 25th. So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote to approve the minutes for open and closed session August 3rd and August 25th. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Um, next, moving on the agenda is the recognitions. The first one we have is the Energizer Bunny. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome. Tonight we'd like to express our appreciation and thanks for the efforts of our talented students and staff. We have a special recognition this evening. On July 30th, 2016, sport stacking students from Centerville Elementary School earned gold at the Junior Olympics hosted in Houston, Texas. The path to gold started eight years ago when Centerville Elementary School formed a morning cup stacking enrichment club to give students time to further challenge themselves with a sport that has been introduced in physical education class. After 12 weeks of morning practices, the kids showcased what they learned at a breakfast and recognition event. Parents were able to see how much the students learned, how they also could see their stronger friendships that they developed, confidence, sportsmanship, and that was developed during the morning club. Each year, many of the 35, excuse me, club members attended the Maryland State Tournament hosted in Anne Arundel County. This year was extra special because the World Sports Stacking National Tournament was hosted at Towson High School and our students were able to attend. Six of our stackers were ranked in the top 10 for their age group, which qualified them for Junior Olympics. The students continued practicing all summer, 
And it showed when all six earned top rankings at preliminaries on July 29th and advanced to compete in the finals on July 30th. The students did an outstanding job representing Queen Anne's County Public Schools, and we are very proud of all of their accomplishments. Would the following students please come forward? Kara Ringgold, uh, Sh Shannon Rath, James Rath, and Lexi Kern earned gold in the eight-year-old team relay against the best teams from the United States and around the world. Bree Kern won gold as part of the six-year-old team relay in which she was teamed with three children from Texas. <laughs> Caitlin Rath earned gold in the 333 individual stacking event with a time of 2.403 seconds. Wow. It was amazing to see this group, ranging in age from 5 to 11, display confidence, perseverance, dedication, sportsmanship, all while having a grand, silly, and fun time together, says Centerville Elementary School PE teacher Mrs. Kern. These students were outstanding state representatives and have such a very bright future, and we are so proud that they are students of Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm round of applause to congratulate our gold medal winner. Congratulations. 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 Thank you. You're welcome. Slide. Oh. <laughs> Here, why don't you step, why don't you step back, or we'll step forward. Are you step back yeah. towards them, back up towards the crowd. Do it, man. One, two, three. Thank you. Oops. Hang on, a couple more. Moms, 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 Heather Wallace has been with Queen Anne's County Public Schools for a year and has already made a huge impact at Kent Island High School and Queen Anne's County High School. She was unanimously nominated for the Spirit Award for her enthusiasm and her tremendous efforts during her time here in Queen Anne's County. Ms. Wallace is the transition coordinator for the special education department working at Ken Island and Queen Anne's High Schools. She has facilitated the growth of our students in a very short amount of time. Collaboratively with parents and staff to ensure a smooth and successful transition from our schools to our, the adult community. She believes in her mission and the community believes in her. Her positive outlook and uplifting morale motivates everyone that she works with. Thank you, Ms. Wallace, for being a great asset to Queen Anne's County Public Schools and what a tremendous impact you've made in such a short amount of time. Thank you. Congratulations. We have another Spirit Award. Would Mrs. McCoy Smith please come forward? Hi. Hi. <laughs> the Spirit Award, the next Spirit Award this month, uh, is from Ken Island uh, High School ninth grade annex. Former uh, Mattapique Middle School principal. Uh, Dr. Angie Holocker nominated Mrs. McCoy Smith for the Queen Anne's County um, Spirit Award. 
Last school year, there was a period of time when Mattapique uh, Middle School art teacher had moved and the current art teacher had not yet joined the team at Mattapique Middle School, so long as the team substituted was assigned to the art class. When Mrs. McCoy Smith learned this, she went to Dr. Holocker and volunteered to write lesson plans for all the Mattapique Middle School art classes. Wow. Mrs. McCoy Smith was taken up on her offer and wrote lesson plans until the current art teacher arrived and continued to help throughout the semester even though she was a new teacher and had her hands full with her own classes at the ninth grade annex. Dr. Holocker states, Mattapique Middle School can never repay her for all that she did for us during our transition time. She deserves this Spirit Award for going above and beyond the call of duty to make sure Mattapique Middle School students had a wonderful art experience during the absence of a teacher. Thank you, Ms. McCoy-Smith, for bringing such spirit to Mattapique Middle School and all of that year's arts classes, and thank you so much for being a dedicated employee to Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Jacqueline Shagan, please step forward. This Difference Maker Award, Jacqueline Shagan, a student from Kennard Elementary School, shared a story with us about m why Mr. Crossley is a difference maker at Kennard Elementary. Jacqueline used to not be so excited about attending school until she had Mr. Crossley as her teacher. She would have Mr. Crosley as a teacher every year if she could. Because he motivates her to want to come to school, she gave us many reasons why he is the best teacher and why we're going to share a few of her reasons this evening. Number one, he makes his lessons so funny that the class can't stop themselves from laughing. Number two, when the students do well in class, he rewards them with speedball or go noodle. Three, his extra activities are the best, in capital letters. Mr. Crosley plays football at recess and lets everyone play. Number five, Mr. Crosley is the weather, weather meteorologist at uh, KES News. There are just a few of the reasons that Mr. Crosley has made a difference in Jacqueline's life. Thank you, Jacqueline, for submitting a wonderful essay, and thank you, Mr. Crosley, for being a difference maker at Kennard Elementary School. Mr. Crosley, could you please come forward? Coach. My final canard act here. She's hoping not. <laughs> Never know. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. um, next on the agenda is the citizen participation public comment. Yes, first we're going to have Mr. Kevin Kintop following Bobby Reed. Great. Don't we have to read something? Get your name on top. 
read the, the statement. Read this the, first, dear. Okay, we, I, I probably read a different one. We ask that all speakers to keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, including their telephone numbers and address. Comments should be limited to two minutes in length. No longer than two minutes should be submitted in writing. Questions or statement to the board should relate to a recent agenda item and agenda items that is expected to appear in the future or a matter of general policy over which the board has authority. Please do not discuss items related to negotiations. Those items are to be dis to be discussed at the bargaining table. Citizens' participation is not intended to be a question and answer session. If you have specific questions, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your question at a later date. The board respects your desire and right to convey your message freely, but ask as a courtesy to the board and our citizens that you respect the board's request to refrain from name naming citizens and name calling when offering your critique. First, we'll have Mr. Kevin Kintop. Uh, good evening, uh, okay. Kevin Kintop, Principal Stevensville Middle School. I'm back for my monthly uh, discussion about calendar. Um, I originally was coming tonight first to thank you. Um, Stevensville Middle School opened up last week for the first time where we let only the sixth graders in the building for the first day. Um, it was the best decision that has been made for transitioning kids into middle school. The sixth graders had the entire building to themselves for the day. They got to get to their lockers, which is the scariest thing to a sixth grader. Um, they got their Chromebooks, they met their teachers, they got to see all the staff. And when day two came and the big six, seventh and eighth graders were there, we just started with school. Everybody went right to class and we started. And it was, uh, if there's anything I would want to keep on the calendar, that would be it. So thank you for putting that in. And as we go forward, please continue to keep that in your minds for the first day. Um, the second thing I'm going to add was something that came up publicly last week, and that is next year's calendar. <laughs> now that we're in the, the throes of possibly starting after Labor Day. Um, I'm just going to once again ask that as we proceed forward with talking about next year's calendar, please, when there are discussions about this and the committees are meeting, please make the discussion about what's best for the kids. I'm afraid right now that we've been mandated with something that was best for um, money making and for other things in the state and it's not what's best for kids. Um, and then once that decision is made as for what's best for kids, please also take into account what's best for the staff that work for this county because they do a lot of hard work with the kids. Um, Parents have great points and parents have a lot of ideas that they think we should do with the calendar and I'm a parent I have my ideas too. Um, but we should definitely make sure that we're doing what's best for the kids and for the staff first. Um, the analogy I use is I never walk into my doctor's office and tell him when to do his stuff and how to do his stuff. He knows his job, I'm going to let him make that decision and I think as educators we need to do that too with our kids. So when we're planning our calendars just please make sure that we're doing the best for kids. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Richard Str Strader. I didn't put the names down of, you guys want to come up? Come on. This is uh, Andrew Bucker. Yeah. He's a teacher at uh, Mat Mattapeak. Mattapeak Middle. And this is Sean Barnum. He's a teacher at Stevensville Middle School. We're here about the same issue. Okay. I've got a, a brief statement to read. Readings board members, Superintendent Paluski, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Richard Strader. I teach at Ken Island High School. We would like to thank all of you for your efforts with regard to the introduction, consideration, and hopefully the adoption of the military experience policy. We are also very grateful <clears throat> that in the most recent version of the policy, you have included the support personnel and those of us currently present here this evening. The first draft of the military experience policy was not retroactive, so those of us present would have been excluded from any consideration either in the past or going forward in the future. <clears throat> Thanks to Mr. Farley's attention to this deficiency, we will at minimum receive the appropriate recognition for our military service and experience which we bring to QA CPS classrooms going forward. <clears throat> As you know, in the past, QA CPS awarded newly hired teachers who were military veterans pays pay for, uh, I'm sorry, pay steps for military service. Although there was no written policy, most newly hired teachers were awarded 
uh, essentially two steps for the standard four-year military commitment. However, there were exceptions. <clears throat> for reasons unknown, the practice continued for a period of time and then ceased roughly 10 years ago, to the best of my knowledge. Mr. Barnum was hired in 2006. He's a veteran of the Air Force. I was hired in March of 2012. I'm a veteran of the Marine Corps. And Mr. Bunker was hired in August of 2014, and he's a veteran of the U.S. Army. Also in consideration here is Brian Sofanowski, who was hired roughly 18 years ago. He is a veteran of the United States Marine Corps as well. And he's not present tonight. During the hiring process, each of us made inquiries to human resources at the time about our status as veterans. We were assured that there was no such policy practice, nor was there any consideration given to our status um, to any new hire in terms of pay or benefits, et cetera. Like my colleagues, it was not until sometime later that I discovered that there were indeed teachers who were veterans that had received pay steps for their military service working in QC QACPS alongside us and were continuing rec to receive the benefit thereof. We are here this evening to propose a fair and equitable solution for those of us who were hired during the cessation of the former practice. Since Mr. Bunker and I have served the least amount of time at QACPS, we request the assignment of one additional step effective at the same time the military experience policy is enacted. For Mr. Barnum and Mr. Sofanowski, and just so you're aware, uh, we are all, including Mr. Sofanowski, in agreement on this. Uh, for Mr. Barnum and Mr. Sofanowski, because of their length of service to QACPS, we request that they be awarded their respective pay steps retroactive to their date of hire. For Mr. Barnum, this would be two pay steps. For Mr. Sofanowski, this would be one. For the small minority of us, these proposed actions would remedy a long-standing disparity that has been the source of much confusion and frustration. <clears throat> I know that you feel, as, I, as we do, that military veterans are a valued asset to any organization, due to what they bring to their dedication, due to what they bring in their dedication and passion to serve. The approval of the military experience policy will go a long way to attract future employees who have served and will become essential members of our school system. Thank you for the opportunity to bring this important, uh, I'm sorry, Thank you for the opportunity to bring the importance of this policy and, of course, this issue. It is important that we make things equitable for the veterans who are currently members of QACPS and have served uh, honorably uh, for a length of time. Finally, we request also that HR conduct an inquiry to all QACPS employees to find fellow veterans as soon as possible. That's all we have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else would like to come up and speak that's not on the list? Okay. And at this time, we will move on to the student member, um, student member of the board reports. And I believe last time we started with Paige. So Anam, would you mind starting tonight? Hi, my name's Anam. Um, so today I'm just going to talk about our Student Government Association uh, updates as well as the overall school updates. So for Student Government, we want to talk about homecoming. Um, so September 30th will be our pep rally at 1 p.m., our parade at 5 p.m., and our homecoming game at 7 p.m. against Y High. And then on October 1st is our actual homecoming dance at 7 p.m. going till 10 p.m. And then our spirit days for the week of homecoming are class colors, Tuesday's USA Day, Wacky Wednesday, Throwback Thursday, and then Friday will be our school spirit day, Buck Day. And then with our overall school updates, I was uh, told to let you guys know that our fall sports started this week. Um, last week was uh, football. Um, our first home game will be this Friday against Elkton. It is also Veterans and First Responders Appreciation Day, so it would be awesome if you guys came out. And we'll be giving special recogni recognition against um, certain individuals. And last Thursday, um, on September 1st, we had our lockdown procedures. Uh, of the overall school report from teachers was that it went well, there were no major concerns. And the last thing is picture day is Friday. So <laughs> tell your 
kids to look pretty. <laughs> <laughs> That's all for me. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. <laughs> Paige? Hi. Okay, so it's Queen Anne's 50th anniversary this year. So we're all really excited about that. And our future educators of America have designed a, a bulletin board in the hallway by our nurse's office that with all the past teachers throughout our 50 years. And we're planning more exciting things to be planned, or we're planning more exciting things to celebrate our 50 years as a school. Uh, we had our back to school night and we did something different this year where we had it before school started and it turned out really well and we had record breaking attendance. So we're probably gonna keep doing that. And we also welcomed 10 new staff as well as our new principal. And we have two members who are now official flaggers. I'm not really sure what that is, but <laughs> they're really excited about it. <laughs> and for our sports, uh, football had their first home game last Friday against Kent County Trojans, and we won against them. And we have another home game Friday against James and Bennett, so we'll come out. A women's soccer won last night against Snow Hill, one to seven, so they did really well. And cross country, field hockey, and men's soccer all had games and meets today. I just came from a meet. It was hot. And then a well, women's and men's soccer tournament, the Lions Cup, is on September 10th at Queen Anne's County High School. So come out for that. Great. A lot happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there really is. Thank you. Um, next on the agenda is the presentations, and the first one we have is the Wellness Connect Connection and an update from Dr. Ciatola and Mrs. Iris Carter. I call him Mr. again. I meant to say doctor. You did. I'm in the way. Good evening. Thank Good you. Evening. Good evening. We're going to give you a update yearly update on the wellness connection that's been in place for the last several years here in the school system. But before we go into that, I feel that we also have a pressing issue here in Queen Anne County. And tonight I've brought Marianne Thompson, our nursing director, Iris Carter, you know, and Bobby Graff, who is our nurse practitioner with the health department. And we've been looking at the statistics that have been presented to us from the state regarding STD incidents in Queen Anne County. And of alarm is specifically the rates of chlamydia and gonorrhea in the 19 to 15 year age bracket. And as we had shared with you informational material before, we would like to have Bobby Graff go ahead and go through this brief presentation of the statistics, the graph, the concerns, and what we're gonna recommend as health department in conjunction with the Board of Ed to be able to address these issues. So, Bobby. So do I, do I do the reverse? Just click it off. Yeah. You didn't need to bring it up. Uh, you're next to the bottom. Okay. So this first graph here is the under 25 population, which represents 76% of chlamydia and 42% of gonorrhea cases in Queen Anne's County during uh, 2010 to 2014. Um, okay, so that's not a pointer. So um, the age 15, there was about 8% um, for chlamydia. You go to the 16 year old age group, represented almost 20%. Um, and then between 17, 17 and 18, it went up to about 52%. There was no gonorrhea in age 15 and about 2% in the 16 and maybe 5% in the 17. These are numbers of cases. Yeah, numbers of cases. <coughs> so how do I flip it? Oh, it just goes down. Okay. All right. Um, this slide here is again age distribution of chlamydia and gonorrhea in the under 25 population for the state of Maryland in 2010 to 2014. Um, <clears throat> and again, it's just showing you the, the rise in the age group. Um, more important, I think, in this slide, this is chlamydia in Queen Anne's County by age groups. And in the 
gosh, this is hard to see. Okay. So in, it's 32% in the blue, which is the age 15 to 19%. So in the upper right hand corner, that's the 15 to 19 year olds, which is representing 32%. And then, um, which is basically what we're concentrating on at tonight's meeting, that age group. Um, so the top part is the chlamydia. At the bottom is the gonorrhea. And um, again, this is 2011 to 2015. The age 15 to 19 year olds represented 16% of gonorrhea cases in Queen Anne's County. Um, this is by gender in Queen Anne's County for chlamydia. 78% of the females represented chlamydia, 22% of males. And for gonorrhea, it was 30% or 37% female and 63% male. <clears throat> um, this is representing by race and ethnicity for 2011 to 2015. Um, for chlamydia in Queen Anne's County, 69% were white and 27% were black, 4% were Hispanic. For chlamydia gonorrhea was 65% white 33% black and 2% Hispanic. This is an important slide here because um, I want to focus on two particular zip code areas. One is 21617, which is Queen Anne's County. Centerville. I mean, Centerville, so that's Queen Anne's County High School. And 21666, which is Ken Island, Ken Island High School. So the top slide there, um, for 21617, in 2011 there were 23 cases, in uh, 2012, 18, 2013, 23, 2014, 20, and 2015 were 20, which represents a total of 99. And then down here at the 21666, which was Ken Island, if you add those all up, that represents 113. So out of all of the zip codes up there at the top, um, 21617, 21638, which is Graysonville, and 21666 had the highest uh, reported chlamydia. And down at the bottom, as far as the gonorrhea totals, again, um, 21617 overall at the very end had 11. Uh, 21638, which is Graysonville, had 14. And 21666 had 11. So those are targeted demographic areas in this county where we're seeing most of the reported cases. This slide is really kind of a representation of what I went over before. Um, except it's, it's now 2011 to 2015, and it's showing that 156 cases of chlamydia and 10 of gonorrhea were in the 15 to 19 year old population. 87% of those being female and 13% being male in the 15 to 19 year olds. And gonorrhea, 70% female and 30% male um, in that age group. Um, again, this slide is basically the same except it's 2011 to 2015 instead of 2010 to 2015. Um, it's just bringing home the point that chlamydia in that population at the top, 68% of them are white females, 15 to 19, 30% black. In the bottom, 50% white and 50% female. And then the very bottom slide again are the zip code areas for the 15 to 19 year olds. And um, gonorrhea and chlamydia combined for 21617 had 38. Um, Graysonville had 27 and Ken Island had 36. This is the, um, sh this slide here. Wait a minute. That's, an increase. That was the That's this one here. This is showing that Queen Anne's County, which is, you, it's very hard to see, but we have had a 30% increase in chlamydia between 2015 and 2016. And because of that, the um, state STD division out of um, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene 
sent um, myself and Dr. Ciotola, Marianne, an email letting us know that we had had this big spike and they offered us um, a pot of money to do extra testing. So we decided to use that pot of money to do free STD clinics here at the health department uh, once a month um, for age 15 to 25 year olds and it's non-invasive testing. It's uh, basically they come in and give a urine test depending on what site of exposure they've had. Um, they may end up getting an oral swab or a rectal swab. But the point is that we've had these summer months and our clinics have been essentially completely not attended by the age group that we need to target. Um, so we have thought that going into the schools to offer this free testing would hit the age groups of the demographics that we're seeing up here. Um, just a couple more slides here. This is the minor consent law. It is the law in Maryland and it states that the law permits minors to receive a contraceptive service on a confidential basis. The law states that a minor has the same capacity as an adult to consent to treatment for or advice about drug abuse, alcoholism, venereal disease, pregnancy, and contraceptive other than sterilization. This means that minors can get the following services without parental knowledge or consent. Pregnancy testing, birth control exams, testing and treatment of sexually transmitted infections. So as you see with this information, <clears throat> we have a concern of what's going on with our population, especially in our high school age children. And with the extra funding that has been provided to the Queen Anne County Health Department from DHMH, we are recommending and providing the ability to do testing on Monday at lunchtime in both high schools, Ken Island High School and Queen Anne High School with a nurse from the Health Department STD and STI program to be able to do appropriate testing and consultation and essentially, if there's been unprotected sexual encounters and there's a question of pregnancy, be able to provide Plan B pills to those individuals at no charge. And this is the recommendation that we are giving to the board. We had presented the information to you previously and we are presenting it now publicly to you. And our recommendation is to move forward with putting a nurse in the high schools at lunchtime in the nurse's office, the school nurse office, to be able to do both the testing and treatment if necessary. Any questions? None. No questions on that. I'll go on to our next article. In conjunction with the Department of Emergency Services, the Queen Anne County Health Department using emergency preparedness funds were able to purchase bleeding control kits for all of the schools in Queen Anne County. There are two bleeding control kits in each school. The school faculty will be instructed by one of the ALS paramedics, who is also a tactical paramedic with the SWAT team, on the use of these bleeding control kits. These <coughs> are for any type of a mass incident that might occur in the school, and it would facilitate bleeding control and hemorrhage with both tourniquets and compressive dressings. We were able to do this with funding from emergency preparedness funding in the health department to put these into the schools, in all of the schools. The school, super, or school principals are coordinating with the Department of Emergency Services for instruction and training and familiarization with the school faculty and employees. Any questions there? Third article, Wellness Connection. Iris will go ahead and go through our yearly report on the uh, Wellness Connection. Not always technical savvy, so. Mm -hmm. Top one. Do you want our okay? Could you do it? I think we already.
Trying to get the, the there, you, there, there we go. go. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. I'm presenting yeah. on the Wellness Connection, and as Dr. Siotola um, has shared, this is a program we've had in the school since the 2011-2012 school year. So this is not a new program uh, to the board. This is the annual report for the last school year. The wellness program is in our middle schools and high schools where we have wellness nurses that go in and provide health education and make students and staff aware of county resources. For the last school year, some of the health education we provided was related to the mental health awareness, tobacco prevention, sun and summer safety, drug and alcohol prevention, and dental prevention. And part of the dental provision, um, we were able to get mouth guards to give to the students in both high schools who pay contact sports. And I think that helped on the school budget as well as um, protecting our kids. And we didn't just provide the mouth guards, we also provided the education that went along with that. For this coming school year, we would like to continue that and actually we have started that with the football players. Um, we're going to plan to increase tobacco use and sales prevention, also prevention along the lines of drugs and alcohol, and one of the new services that we are implementing for this year with the board approval is text and nurse. Also summer, sun and summer safety. For the total encounters, which you see in red for the past school year, um, each school is listed there. Some of the schools, our numbers were down slightly and we contribute that to, um, we were short with nursing staff part of the school year. This is a reflection of all counters that we provided for resources and health education. And of critical incident, just look at that STI column. We had zero encounters with students. Also, what you can note on this slide, the bulk of our resources is going towards health education. That's the service that we provide actually in the classroom with the students as well as lunchtime displays. This slide reflects all the schools and just what happened with the students. Again, this is students and all the resources that we provided. This is collectively. And the next set of slides that I'll be getting into will show each school individually. So this was Anchor Point. Centerville Middle. Canal Island High School. Mattapique Middle School. Queen Anne's County High School, <coughs> Stevensville Middle School, Sellersville Middle School, and this is our total encounters for the year. It's broken down by the quarter in the first section. The second section, the midsection there, is broken down as a reflection of what you can see, what each school year uh, looked like, beginning with the 2012-13 school year, and then over to 2013-14, 14-15, and then this last school year. So you can see all encounters each year increase, except again, this last school year, we did have a, a slight decrease due to our staffing. Ms. Iris, not one discussion about STIs in any of this 10,000 encounters. It was like four in one school and that was it. As far as referral for re students, yeah. but we do uh, provide information in the health classes okay. as part of the presentation. At the bottom um, is a reflection of our teen pregnancy rate. And in the shaded light purple lilac at the top, that was the beginning where we actually started initiating services. Green was the 2012-13 school year. The yellow goes down to 2013-14. And then the blue is 
2014-15, and then our last school year is in the purple. It appears purple there. I'm going to get out of this and go into Texan Nurse. Texan Nurse is something I think everyone has received information on that already to review. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it's a service that we would like to enhance the wellness program with. It will allow the students to have access to a nurse to text questions. Um, what you see there is, is the phone number that we have um, received. Nurses will be available Monday through Friday from 8 to 4.30 to text um, information back to the student. The student can text at any time. Um, so when the, if they text in the evening and when the nurse comes in that morning, um, she can respond to the question. Along a line of questions, it could be anything relating to a healthy lifestyle, exercising, dental hygiene, nutrition, reproductive health, um, living a smoke-free life, drug and alcohol questions, or any other health-related topic that the student would like information on. This is not intended to be used as any type of uh, medical emergency type service. It's more for information sharing. We would like to um, take and market this so the students will take advantage of it. And with that being said, we would like to have information in the nurses station. Um, we have a flyer and the little tear-offs, like at the bottom with the numerous number, um, sheets of numbers that a student could tear off. And they can actually um, have that information on hand and reach a nurse at any point. So even if something comes up over the weekend and they have a concern or can't seem to find the information that they're needing, they can access this resource through Texan Nurse. Um, we also um, would like to do this because we think it's a good way to utilize our nursing resources. We had a nurse assigned to each school um, to go in weekly, and at times they weren't being utilized. Um, and as you can see in the previous slides, the bulk of the time was health education. So that was meaning they were either in the classroom or doing a lunchtime type of display to offer education versus um, being in the building and not getting referrals. So with your approval, I'd like to continue to move forward with this. I do have to ask, uh, I don't know how the other board members feel about this, but I, I really think that we need to really discuss this about offering the Plan B emergency con contraception in our high schools um, without a parent consent. Uh, I mean, I, I, one of my daughters went in, I would want to know. So I don't know how that's going to work, and I'm, we haven't addressed <coughs> this to any of our parents. I mean, I understand about the, you know, the testing of, for the STIs and, and possible treatment, but again, I think the parents want to know. I agree, Tammy, um, because I think I made this comment last time um, to this group was my concern was I would want to think that all children, um, young adults, have the opportunity to use it, but I do have a problem with a young adult having one of these uh, diseases and a parent not being notified of it. I do have a problem with that. I think we need to poll the parents. I think we need, it's a community, a it's not It's not really a board issue, I think it, it's a community issue, mm -hmm. and... Um, Got Comar that's, right. that says that these young ladies and gentlemen are under law, under Comar, state regulation, allowed to come in and be tested without parental consent for specifically that reason, because some children would be afraid, and as you have seen, we have had almost zero response in this age group when we have offered STI evaluation and counseling here during the summer, we know that there is activity going on in our county. We also know mm -hmm. that we have a significant degree of increased chlamydia as well as gonorrhea. Chlamydia will lead to essentially untreated sterilization. Okay? So I understand. I'm a, I'm a parent, a grandparent, and I would hope that my child would come to me or my grandchild. But in order to protect these children, 
Under law, we have, they have the right to have testing. And why are we offering the plan B as well? May I speak? I mean, I'm just asking, I mean, I'm just asking. Because if you're at risk for an STD, you're at risk for a pregnancy. And uh, in 2013, they removed all barriers for reproductive age. You, you can purchase plan B over the counter. Over the counter. A 12-year-old can walk in because they're a reproductive age. And I did have the slide as to the expense of the Plan B. Perhaps those five pregnancies, I think it was, last year would have been prevented could those teens have access Plan B at the time. If you're having unprotected sex and you acquire chlamydia, then you can also acquire a pregnancy. More than half of pregnancies are mistimed, unplanned. I have a 17-year-old daughter right now at the high school who's a senior. And the way I look at this is <clears throat> I've educated them the best that I can. And just like I want her to be out there safe having gone through driver's education so that she's buckled and everything else, I've done the same thing with STD and pregnancy prevention. Kids don't think when they get into that situation. A lot of times it just happens. And as I said before, Plan B has to be given within five days, preferably 72 hours. The cheapest Plan B, and I, I have that slide that, the cheapest Plan B, well, first off, um, two of the pharmacies when I called didn't even have it in stock. Mm -hmm. So if it's Friday night yeah, the, and you've had sex, and you can't get it based on where you live, then your timing is now down to a critical time factor. The cheapest is $39.99, and that's generic. The most expensive was $50. Not many teens have access to that. It's free at the health department. Um, sorry. No, I, I just want to say that, you know, as a parent, I totally 100% agree with you, and I'm fine with the way things are set up. However, I know there's going to be community members that might not feel comfortable having it in or handing it out in the school. So I, my my advice would maybe to be is put it out for comment on our website and see what we hear back from the community. Um, and try to help base our decision on a, as a community as a whole. But we have a catch-22 here because if there are students already infected, I mean, advanced stages of gonorrhea and syphilis, and I, I mean, it's we're we're putting their health at risk. So it really is a catch-22 for all of us here. <coughs> what you're asking us to do? You're just talking about the Plan B. Is that all no? You're I'm talking, talking about all of it. I'm, I'm talking, talking about, about all of it. it. I mean, I think there's a difference between going to the. You know, some parents are are just going to be hung up with you're giving it out at school. Is what I right. as what I would feel would be the community pushback. Personally, I don't have a problem with it, but I can't. I don't feel comfortable making that decision for the entire community without getting feedback from the community. Um, we're giving you the health information. Exactly. That's our role. We're giving you the health information. We're also providing you with the mechanism to both test, treat, and hopefully prevent. So, right. I mean, what I'd your decision... I'd actually like to say something. Sorry. Um, you can continue to... You all have to be comfortable with what is going on in the schools. We understand that, okay? If you want us to start just STI testing, we can do that as of Monday of next week. If you want to have a discussion about the plan B, that's another issue. If we want to break this into two components, I'm okay with that. I'm not, I don't think it's the way we should go as a health officer, but I am comfortable with the fact that you need parental comment. Mm -hmm. um, as like a student perspective, because obviously I have no idea how you guys feel because I don't, I'm not a mother in any way, thank goodness, but um, <laughs> Personally, I was not aware about the health clinics, and I don't think that there's enough <coughs> awareness of the options that we have. I don't think the students are aware, because I personally am not aware. And I also do not believe that, like, the idea during lunch, I don't think many students are going to go anyway. There's always a social aspect playing. There's, it's, it's always in place. And possibly after school would be a great idea. And then it also comes in, like, the parents, the school, if you are planning on giving out Plan B, 
the parents will come in and they will be start blaming the school. Even though we're trying to help the kids, they won't see it that way. It's a good perspective. Paige, what about you? I agree with Anam. I, I don't know if we did it during lunch shifts. Like, I don't think you would get much participation from that. I also didn't know about what was going on during the summer or anything like that. And it would be hard to get the word out also for students to know during lunch because then if they're going to the nurse's office and other students see them going, then they'll get called out and some kids are just too afraid to go do that with like their peers looking at them. <coughs> Trying to save face, so. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever think of, um, uh, this is wonderful, um, terrible stuff, but it's good to know you have the service. Maybe like the Ask a Nurse line where you have the phone numbers. The same thing, if you have that ability for them to call a nurse and set up an appointment so it isn't so obvious what they're doing at lunchtime, just a thought, because it sounds like they're not going to be doing the lunchtime thing. Um, well, they're not coming into the health department either. <laughs> no, they're not. Right. But right. what is yeah. another option that would still meet their needs and well, then not be embarrassing? Not in school, let's say you come to the health department before school starts and you're late, you get a robocall to the home. So then your parent knows that you were late. If you've got to go somewhere, after, if you play a sport or if you have to catch the bus, you, you can't get up there. So they can't leave school to come up because their parents going to know if they can't get there after school if they're not driving if they play a sport or they have an after school activity so that was the concept kind of bringing it to them is there some way that we might be able to do um, not necessarily well I agree with doing a parent survey because I, I think that all parents should be aware um, I'm not sure that parents are aware of what's going on I, I commend you all I really do um, but you're sitting here listening to two teenagers that saying they're not going in there at lunchtime. Is there a way to do a survey in the two high schools and even the middle schools to ask the kids how they would prefer to do it? Well, uh, I, there's a couple questions that's I have. Complicated. I, I just wanted to say, um, for the kids, um, I think it's wonderful to be in place because a lot of times you could save somebody's life while you're trying to worry about your, your kid disrespecting you or not letting you know that shouldn't even be an issue. Because if, like you said, they get pregnant, okay, and you're home, you don't want them to go through this program. But when they get pregnant, they'll ask, you know, can we get it aborted? We could have prevented all of that. To save face for who, for what? So I just think it was in place when I was in high school, when Iris and I graduated together. And I, my parents were religious, and they <laughs> did not play taking no birth control pills. Uh, but Arlene Taylor went and got some, because I didn't want no kids out of wedlock. But my parents didn't know until I got older, I would tell my mom, and she would say, you did that? I said, yeah, you ain't know. But <laughs> so you're I, advocating it. was to me. You you're know? advocating it to have it in the schools. Yes. I'm okay with it in the schools. As far I as the just, testing. I'm listening to two teenagers that are saying that the kids aren't going to use it. That's, well, I'm okay with it. I just, I think we have to come up with a better idea than, you know, these kids only have a half an hour at lunchtime. And as both of them have said, they, the stigma of going into the nurse's office and a friend seeing them. Um, I. I just think that maybe we need to think of a better way to to use that service. I don't know how. I honestly don't. I mean, I don't. Well, one of the don't they have a health class? Yeah, but not everybody has health class at the same time. Mm. Majority of students. But well, could we use it in the health class? Grade. Could we do something in the health class? Well, well, I think there's there's really two key pieces here, and I think that's what uh, Dr. Ciatola is. One that it seems very obvious is getting the information out that Absolutely. was shared. Absolutely. Is that the power behind what has been shared this evening is we have a growing problem right. and we right. need to tackle it as as a community and as and a now. county. And now. And, and I think you know to to um, Dr. Steve I mean a, a quick question I mean you wouldn't be bringing us this recommendation if it wasn't best practice um, that you're seeing across areas across the country that are experiencing similar uh, obviously you wouldn't be bringing that to us as if you're not seeing that other school jurisdictions are trusting and treating in school 
specifically Dorchester. On the shore? Dorchester. Mm -hmm. On the shore? Yep, Dorchester. Dorchester. And are they doing it at lunchtime? They're doing it all day. They have a wellness center. That's this is a process in trying to develop those in our high schools. I mean, we started with the wellness right. program. We're now trying to increase the capability of what we're providing to the school. We looked at our nursing schedule and it was Monday and we wanted to catch the kids after a weekend on a Monday. We can give a longer period of time than just the 30 minutes if you know you want to leave an hour and a half to two hours every Monday at noon to two at the school that's fine we can work that out and if the, you know there's not enough time at lunch but the point of the matter is we're we're willing to accommodate as best we can yeah. with the nursing staff we have and and maybe one of the first best steps to take is an information night for parents that parents are able to engage with health professionals yeah. in what the data says and what you know what is being recommended right. so parents have an opportunity to ask questions to the experts on right. the parents. But Mr. Poliski right now we have students at risk isn't it isn't it prudent on our part to allow Dr. Ciatola to have the have them start on Monday to at least test potential people I mean we're we're, we're putting our students health at risk they can only test if they'll go in there, though. That's that's they, if right. They is that at least it? offer them right. the service to go in mm -hmm. to see a nurse to, to get tested? They ha this is for their lives. I mean, I, I don't want to stop that. On morning announcements, you know, like the student says, you know, this I, would, is, I wouldn't announce. I, what I the wouldn't make. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't there will know be how enough information after tonight's meeting and when this goes public, there's going to be enough discussion throughout this county of what the health department's trying to do in the two high schools. Prevent. Okay. And I think the word will well, get out. I mean, if, we'll get have enough no. emails to answer back. So. <laughs> <laughs> but give us the time that you're going to be there so we can tell the parents. <laughs> well, what, one of the problems is the plan B. Could we pull that out yeah. yes. and then I mean, institute have, the rest of the yeah. um, things? And then we need to have a discussion, I would say, definitely with parents on the plan B thing, because there's a lot strongly opposed to that plan B right. for religious and other reasons. I understand that. But I, I don't think we should stall on getting this moving, in, in particular the STIs. At the same time that we can hold parent outreach so that parents have an opportunity to be informed, I think is also critical. Do we need to make a motion to allow Dr. C to go into the schools, or can we just, do we need to make well, a motion? Well, it was a recommendation, so I believe we do need to make a motion. Because this is the second time he's been here. Yeah. So I need a motion to... Um, approve the recommendation of Dr. Ciatola um, with regards to testing and um, we're going to hold off on the plan B but as far as everything else. As far as STIs. Yeah. So moved. I have a, I have a motion and, and for which a testing? <coughs> Pregnancy STIs. testing? STIs? It's testing and treatment. Are we going to provide let them do birth control? You gonna hold off. Treatment of the STIs. Right. She gonna hold off on birth control, which you said religious yeah. reasons. Well, Plan B. Yes. So. Plan B is a separate control. issue. Not birth control. I'm talking about. No, no, you no, provide no, no. birth it's control method contraceptives, right? No, no, no. If a child wants to the health department. Pardon? They can come to the health department. Health department for that. Okay. So the motion on the on the table is to approve the recommendation of testing of the STIs in. And both and pregnancy. and pregnancy in both um, Queen Anne's County High School and Kent Island High School. That's so moved. Okay. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? I call for the vote to approve the recommendation for STI testing and pregnancy testing and treatment and treatment at both um, Queen Anne's County High School and Kent Island High School. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. The ayes have it. Thank is you. it, is it out you. there in the public, I mean, in the schools that they can get free birth control from the health department if they want birth control? Um, it, 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 it is. It is. Mouth is for, that part for of your... For many reasons, they're not coming I mean, to it, the health department. Information is available. Yeah. It, it is. Been okay. Out there. So, any other questions on tonight's presentation? Thank you, Dr. C. Mm -hmm. all no, right. thank, thank you all thank very you. much. Thank you. Nurses will be in both high schools Monday afternoon. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Ciotola. So how are we going to pursue the, the next step? 
We have to put it on our website. Right. We'll put out for comment. And our Facebook page. <coughs> put out for comment. So we'll put the comment out um, tomorrow. On Plan B. And you know we're going to have feedback, some. Feedback line. We're going to have feedback about. Put it out tomorrow. That's about fine. the STIs. You know that. That's fine. Mm -hmm. oh. I'll take it. You have to but it, it's down. a state. I mean, it's Comar. It's not like we're making this up ourselves. I mean, it is something that they can or to act in by law get. Well, it's so. being proactive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the treatment. I mean, this, this, are, this is their health. Mm -hmm. Okay, next on the agenda is the BTE master plan, the annual review. Uh, I think you missed. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I missed Mr. Middleton. He's probably like, what? Um, next on the agenda, my apologies, is the superintendent search process presentation by Mr. Bill Middleton and Dr. Thelma. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do, uh, what was your last? Dr. Thelma Monk. Thank you. It's all right. I'm going to use this. No. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, having us and giving us some time to uh, go through this. Uh, just so you'll know who we are, uh, I'm Bill Middleton, uh, the lead consultant for the Maryland Association of Boards of Education on superintendent searches. Uh, been doing this for a while. I think this is my 22nd search in the state of Maryland. Uh, so we, we have one goal in doing this, and that is to help the board come up with a superintendent that fits in your county at this time. It may not be a fit somewhere else. It may not be something else, but we're looking for someone that fits in your school system and can take your school system forward. Uh, we are consultants for your information we do not vote on anything okay we advise the five members of this board of education and they're the only ones that have a vote on anything in this process one thing that we do require is that there be considerable input from the community at two steps which you will see as we go through uh, you advise the board just like we do what do you think about this what do you think about this candidate and the board votes uh, at the end of the process in open session to select a new superintendent. Uh, the process is a lengthy one partly because of the input from community and employees. Uh, the timeline that you're going to see proposes that this be finished in April uh, and we'll go through that process. Uh, superintendent search process for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Okay, the purpose identify the best leader for your school system at this point in its development. Plan and execute a search process that is thoughtful, responsive, fair, and legal. Okay, we haven't added that word yet, but it has to be legal, and in today's society, part of my job is to keep it legal, and part of Dr. Monk's job is to keep me out of trouble. <laughs> okay? Uh, by the way, <laughs> I forgot, I'm a retired superintendent from Salisbury, Wicomico County. Uh, I've been doing this for a while. Dr. Monk uh, is a retired human resources director in Montgomery County, has been working with me for some time on this, and is the best person I've found yet to get information out of references that they don't want to give you. So uh, and she, that's one of her primary responsibilities. Uh, planning the search, identify the criteria to be used in initial screening. What are you looking for in a superintendent? And the board needs to identify those up front. Not after the people get here and after you start talking with them. You identify the criteria up front. We started on that today. Identify the desirable characteristics of the future superintendent. They don't do that until the next one is done. And that is gather public input. Uh, in the process, defining characteristics. On October the 5th at 4 o'clock, uh, there will be an open forum here for employees of the school system to 
participate in this process. At 6.30 in this room, there will be an open session for anyone else, stakeholders involved, and we will tell you what you're going to be talking about in a few minutes. Uh, what do we do? Establish a timeline for the search. You will see a draft of that. Develop an application form and a flyer. Uh, the application form is in process of being done today. The application is basically done online. Uh, and it's a pretty significantly long application. Uh, advertise a position through appropriate media. We do today a lot more internet and not less paper advertising. We also contact many groups in the state of Maryland and throughout the nation, National School Boards Association and the school board groups, and they put the ad up on their website so it gets national attention. Quite frankly, it used to be that you could do a quote, local search. You can't do that anymore. The minute it goes on your website, it's an international search. So for someone to say, we're just going to look in the state of Maryland, <laughs> You really can't do it anymore. Uh, the, after we do the advertising, which will stay out on the street 30, 45 days, something like that, everything that comes in goes to the MABE office. It does not come here. None, none of the uh, applications, references, or anything else will be filed or handled in this office. That is just the way we do it. Uh, and. The board will see all the applications. They will look at the criteria that they have established. For instance, one of them is must meet Maryland certification requirements. So they will be looking at that. There's some others that they will do. And the characteristics. Uh, we want someone that has a strong instructional background in pre-K education. I, that, that's just off the top of my head, OK? Uh, and Anything that goes on those criteria and characteristics guide the questions that are asked in interviews, guide the score sheets that are used after interviews, so that it all goes straight to the criteria and characteristics. Uh, MAVE conducts first round reference checks, and we identify with the board six to eight people for initial interview. The numbers are not important, okay? Uh, the board sees all the applications and reviews them and then decides how many people they want to bring in for the first interview. The initial interview is a highly structured interview. You have X number of questions. The questions are read to each applicant. They all get the same questions and there are no follow-up questions. So if the person blows an answer, there's no follow-up. No, a board member can't say, well, the question says this, but you didn't answer that. Well, they didn't answer it. She didn't answer it. And that's part of the scoring process for the first interview. Uh, intensive background reference checks, we continue those. Second round interviews, a totally different type of interview that we use. On the second interview, the applicant comes in and makes a presentation to the board for up to 30 minutes on a topic selected by the board. And that's, that's something we'll work out with the board. It is a, uh, a, something that they feel is important that the future superintendent needs to handle or be aware of, and they make a presentation. The interesting part of that is the presentation is done without a PowerPoint. It must be standing on their own two feet or sitting in their own chair. They may have handouts. But it's not a PowerPoint that somebody in IT or in something else has prepared for them, and all they have to do is click it and talk about it. We got burned, <laughs> and we don't do that anymore. So it's, it is a old-style paper presentation. Uh, the board, after the second round of interviews, selects the people that they believe can be superintendent here successfully, and they announce the finalist. Uh, and then the candidates will spend a day here uh, in this county. They'll meet with staff, students, parents, community, and those groups will have about 50 minutes with the candidate throughout the day, and will provide feedback to the board in two areas for each candidate. 
strengths that you see in this candidate or concerns that you have about this candidate. And that is written up by the group, it's photocopied and given to the board. We don't, we don't mess with it, okay? Uh, confer with the state superintendent of schools after you pick the person that you'd like to have. Uh, the state superintendent must approve any superintendent that you want to name. Typically, the state superintendent asks one question. Is this the, can, is this the vote of the board, that this who's going to name? Two, does this person meet the certification requirements? And one of my jobs is to work with the applicants and the state uh, superintendent's office to see that anybody that gets to this step meets certification requirements. I do not want to be embarrassed by a super state superintendent saying no, they don't meet the certification requirements. Uh, the board will have to negotiate with the top candidate to be sure that they're still here. And I will be honest with you that we have had numerous people get to this stage and say, no, I think I've changed my mind. I do not want to proceed to uh, the, f the job. Uh, don't ask me what the magic bullet is and why they do that, but it, it does happen. And then the board has to meet in public session to appoint the new superintendent. The only way they can do it is have a, an official board meeting and vote, and a majority of the board vote for that superintendent. Uh, there's no other way to do it, really. Okay, what does it take for certification? I saw some heads nod about certification. It's very important. The person, ha first of all, has to be certifiable in either child, early childhood, elementary, or secondary education. In other words, they have to have a teacher's certificate in Maryland. They have to have a master's degree, at least. Notice it does not say they have to have a doctor's degree, okay? In Maryland, you do not have to have a doctor to be a superintendent. But you must have at least three years of successful teaching experience. So for a person to be a superintendent in Maryland, they must have taught in the classroom for at least three years. They also must have at least two years of administrative or supervisory experience in a pre-12 case setting. Uh, that means, basically it really means vice principal on up, principal, central office, or whatever. Now each board can decide that that administrative experience should be something different than that. It could be more stringent if they wanted it to be. I have had boards that said, uh, I want the person to at least have a director's level experience in the central office. That, that's up to the board to determine. Uh, submit a minimum of 24 credits beyond the master's degree. That's new. It used to say 30 credits, but it, you could have it as part of your master's if you got 32 credits or something in your master's. Now it has to be after your, grad, after your master's degree is awarded, education administration supervision, and including specifically courses in these areas. I will say to you very candidly, if you take these and take them to any university in Maryland and tell them you want to take these courses, they're going to say to you, we don't know what courses fit in which category. And that is becoming a real issue. These have only been in effect for about two years when they changed it from 30 to 24. I have a candidate right now that has a doctorate plus uh, 12 hours in administration, public school administration, and does not meet <laughs> two of these areas. And he can't find courses that meet two of these areas. So it is, a, it is an issue. Uh, there's another way to do this, and that's the next. If you are a superintendent in a, can in a state other than Maryland, you can obtain a Maryland superintendent certificate if you have worked at least 27 months under a superintendent certificate as a superintendent in the other state. So if you are coming from Delaware and you've been certified in Delaware as a superintendent and you've worked at least 30, 27 months, three years, 
Maryland will issue you a certificate provided, basically, that you have your three years of teaching, your two years of other things. Uh, they will not do that, those coursework counts, but they still want you to have the other experience factors. Timeline. Now, let me throw a caveat out there. This is a timeline and it's very flexible. It is not an absolute. Uh, anything can get in the way of this. Uh, you know, you can't get something scheduled or you have a snowstorm or whatever. Uh, basically, we started today with the board uh, and the next step is October the 5th that I mentioned right here, gathering input from stakeholders. After that, the board will use that information and their own ideas to develop the criteria and characteristics they want in a new superintendent. We will then present them with an application that they will approve. They are in the process of considering developing a brochure to go on the website along with the ad uh, and to uh, send out and the ad. We talked tonight about advertising and they're going to, I think, do a lot of internet and not a lot of paper for advertising. Notice who is involved. The first step planning, stakeholders put in the first input, the board and of course the consultants. The second, the board, the whoever who develops the brochure and again the consultants. Hopefully the application will go out uh, in uh, probably <coughs> December uh, and be back sometime in January. Then they start uh, reviewing the applications. Again, they will see every application and uh, they will see what we come up with with reference checks and then they will do interviews. They will also do a second round of interviews and then the, the meetings with the uh, people, community focus groups. Uh, then they appoint the superintendent, as I said, in a meeting. Now, the last slide is a slide that if you come to the forums on October the 5th, is you will see. Uh, do you have the questions? Are the questions on there? I don't think so. Let's see. Yes. yes. It's right here. <laughs> okay, the first one, you'll be asked to list three or four things you feel are the most positive things about Queen Anne's County and the Queen Anne's County Public Schools. The board will use that information in developing their brochure and advertising and encouraging people to apply for the job. And if they select someone, use those to say this is why you ought to take the job, okay? It's a recruiting tool that we use. The uh, second question is write four or five characteristics and qualifications you feel a superintendent should possess. This is what you want. These are the, the nitty gritty details of what you want in a superintendent. The third question, list three or four challenges you think the new superintendent will face. <laughs> we use that in not so we don't surprise people after they get here. <laughs> we tell them that these are some of the challenges that you're gonna face uh, according to the people that work and live here. Uh, that's the reason that we have the, the focus groups in the beginning and the reason that you're invited to participate and other people are invited to participate. That's the, the rundown on the, on the uh, search and I'm open to any questions from the board or the floor. Uh, well, they, they have to meet the basic requirements, uh, but typically, yes. If they've been a superintendent for at least three years or thereabouts in another state, they can become certified. Now, the qualification thing is for this board to decide. The state board doesn't decide on qualifications. I didn't mean qualifications. I meant the things that we Certi said. Yes, that's correct. People had to meet. Yes, that's um, correct. Not well, yeah, it's, it's fair. Uh, most, most states have pretty stringent certification requirements for superintendents. So it, it, it's fair. And I'll tell you, it opens up the pool. Okay. 
It really does. It opens up the pool. Anybody else have any questions? Anyone else? Okay, thank you. I look forward to working with you and we'll get her done, as they say. <laughs> I'd like to yes. clarify, though, that to the public, though, that the um, announcement about the October 5th meeting, we're going to be advertising about that to be sure we have folk, people here from all over the county. Yes, the board will be advertising about the October 5th meeting. And please, please take the time to come, get input at the outset. The board will listen. I will assure you <laughs> uh, that the consultants will require this board to review anything that is turned in. Mm -hmm. Okay? There, there's no shortcuts. And I discussed this with them today. The process works. Uh, we we feel it works well, and we don't shortcut it. Yes. So you said when this October 5th meeting occurs, it's an open for the entire county, anybody with interest, and it's scheduled to be in this room? Yes. The board meeting is, our board meeting is October 12th. We won't be here. We will not be here. <laughs> yeah, the board rescheduled because of another conflict, so this board will be available on October 5th, and their meeting will be October 12th. No, I was just wondering the size and location of this parents and staff and everybody. I believe staff is cool. earlier. It, it, yeah. There's a time slot for staff and a time slot for community. Yes. Staff, staff is at 4 and parents at 634. If we run out of room, there'll be two of us and we'll find another room to go work in. Okay. We, we'll make it happen. Yes. I have another clarifying question. At the end when you said people can write their top characteristics about Queen Anne County on chart paper, does that mean those stakeholders actually have to be present or could we electronically <coughs> so we get input from our whole community? I'm not following you. That last uh, slide that you had that brought up the two questions. Okay, yes. So it said something about writing on chart paper. Yes. It appeared to me that would be for the people that were in the room. Yes. So is that possible though because we will be limited by who's part Why of the that? But that's really critical She's input. She's talking about the paper with the questions so on the end. The <coughs> There will be 12 to 15 people in each of those groups, representative of the entire county. So, you know, if if somebody needs to have input, it needs to be through them. But there's no reason that you can't send an email to the Mave consultant, which the name will be announced, and have direct input at both levels. As a matter of fact, the board I think is planning to do a survey mm -hmm. of the first. Uh, group of questions, uh, put it on their website, and parents or whoever, staff, can fill out the, the survey. It will go directly to MABE, and we will bring the results back to the board. Anything else? Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Middleton, yeah. and thank you, Dr. Monk. Um, next on our agenda is the BTE Master Plan, the annual review. Sally. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Okay. Now I expect everybody's read every word <laughs> that was in this first draft. <laughs> Riveting, Julie. Riveting. <laughs> um, as you all know, this is the, the first draft. Um, so this plan will be presented to you at the next board meeting and it will be essentially what we're planning on submitting to MSDE by the 15th. If you've reviewed it, you've seen there's some big differences between this plan and previous plans. I'm going to digress just a minute for our, our student board members so that they understand what this is. Essentially what this is, is, the mass, is our Bridge to Excellence annual update. And it's just telling the state in a condensed version what we as a county did as far as testing and, and academics and those kinds of things. This year, it is very limited. In past years, we've been talking about how we're um, producing <coughs> wonderful teachers, how we're producing uh, systems of technology that will inform us about how we're all doing, but this plan has gone down to a few basic things, and that's, I believe, the governor's plan is to streamline the process and to streamline what's in this. 
So this year, essentially what they're asking is how our subgroup populations did as compared to our aggregate population. So you, aggregate population, you take everybody in your school and you say, look, on the park assessment or on the HSA biology test, how did everybody do? And then they look for two main groups. The first one is students who are receiving special education services. How did they do as compared to everybody else in the aggregate? And then the second group is how are EL students, English learners, doing as compared to everybody who's in the aggregate? And then they ask you to, to tell how any group, subgroup, that's some, a group made up of 10 or more members. So it might be uh, farms, which is free and reduced meals. It might be um, Hispanic. It might be African American. But there are a bunch of groups. It might be um, Native American Indian is what they, or Native American, I think they have that. So those are the groups. And then they ask you for each of the different major tests and major content areas. It would be elementary reading, middle school reading, 10th grade HSA, or excuse me, PARC, not HSA anymore. It's math from third grade up through 12th grade, or through ninth grade, and then the algebra test. Then they also have the biology HSAs, they also have the middle and the high school, and then they have the government test, which was limited just to what our state or our county tests were because they didn't have the test yet that last year to benchmark it with. So that is what the main bulk of this plan is. Then they're asking us for something curious this year, which is what, uh, what tests are we given? Because they want to make sure that the tests that we are given are helping to drive our instruction to give the very best instruction that we can give. So we, um, Mr. Dave Brown, who is our an accountability supervisor, has listed all of the tests. And so the last pages of this, from page 67, well, it's actually 40 pages, lists all of the different tests at all of the different levels for all of the major content levels. Even the ones that are not, um, that are just created here through the board. So that is what is the bulk of our, our uh, plan. It's a lot simpler than previous years and all the things because that was really addressing how we were spending money associated with different things. So. We haven't, re we haven't received that. That wasn't in our... It was, pre um, pre I sent it on Friday afternoon to be posted to... Okay, um, I just didn't get it, so can we make sure it gets posted? Oh, yeah, we'll review sure, it? absolutely. Um, and I will say that one thing you will notice, um, for example, as you look at this, it's we decided to go this year with a very structured approach. So we got our, because the two main subgroups that we're talking about are special education, students who receive special education and ESOL. So we had the people who are supervising those two areas give our approaches like what are you going to do to meet the needs, what kind of strategies are you going to use and where are we going to get those money from. So that each of the different content coordinators, the math coordinator, the reading coordinator, and everybody else could have the same types of language in there because we do try to do things systemically so that everybody's on the same page. You will notice that in this there's a black band. That is because ironically the data is embargoed and it cannot be given out to you about how the aggregate scored. So I can tell you how far the groups are away from the aggregate score. And that's what we're really concerned with is um, which groups are performing so far away from the aggregate that we're like, we've really got to pay attention to this. Generally, it's 10 percentage points that we're, or more that we're really concerned with. You know, we'd like things to be without any gap, but we did not, in most cases, we did not mention it if it was like, seven percent but when it gets to ten percent that's a that's a huge gap that needs to be addressed so 
So that's kind of the mass, well, the Bridge to Excellence annual update. And it's always talking about what happened in the past. I have a question. Sure. At the last meeting, Mr. Brown was here, and we were talking about the biology HSA. And did we ever make a, did you guys make a decision about <coughs> whether or not the biology HSA is going to be taken away? Or at least come to a, like, you know, because, you know, that was one of the major concerns last time. There is the, one person in the room who may be able to answer that, and his name is Mr. Michael Page. Mm. He is right over here. Michael, do you want to answer about the biology HSA? Sure. The, uh, on. He's the science supervisor, in case you have not met him. Sorry, Michael. <laughs> so the um, biology HSA is going away, and it's being replaced by a different test. And that different test is called the Maryland Integrated Science Assessment. So we will be field testing, well, I'm sorry, this, excuse me, this year they are taking the biology HSA. The next year they will be field testing the new test, which is the MISA. Is the biology HSA this year, for those who take it, will still be a graduation requirement? We're still determining that at this time. Who determines that, dear? The state. The state, state does. When we say we, it's the royal we. Okay. <laughs> it's the state. And they'll let us know what they decide soon? Yes, the state, and correct me, Mr. Pluski, if I'm, I'm wrong, but the state is meeting, the state board is meeting next month to determine uh, the outcome of that. Which is their October state meeting. So these students are going to take this test for the purpose of just taking the test if it's not a graduation requirement. Right, you still have students that are going to be in phasing out that graduation requirement as we're phasing in the next level of the assessment. So there's still a there's still a bridge just as we've been doing with yeah. all of the all transitioning long. to to um, uh, the park assessments. But I think the the major focus, there's a couple things I think are really big to highlight here. Number one is changing our academic indicators of performance. So the Bridge to Excellence document that Joy is talking about, it's a compliance document that really talks about what we've done in the past. So at our next work session, this is really a good segue, that we're going to start digging into that data that she's talking about as it relates to the gap. And so uh, at our next session, we'll begin talking about our advanced placement data. Data. And then as the park assessment, the embargo gets lifted, that will be the next phase. So you're going to get all that information with the notion of, remember we talked about the Innovation Center, all of this work is, is to eliminate the achievement gap, period. So all the strategies, all of our focus, all is tied into that elimination of the achievement gap. So we've got it narrowing in some areas, but we've got areas that we know that we're not making as, as great of gains. Uh, but we're still new into that we're going into year three. So, but I appreciate all the instructional staff for all of the work that they've done on that. But as Julia mentioned, this is much pared down. And I think the State Department is really looking at the whole document and its value that it's providing to school systems and looking at maybe restructuring it. So this year is a pared back to look at how it might be structured in the future. The the previous ones that you guys saw with all the charts and all the things that went on forever because we had to come up with goals and essentially what they were asking is well how did you use your money and what was the effect because we were setting these things in place now it is more about how did the kids do on this assessment on this curriculum and where are your your gaps between your your subgroups and your aggregate population so that's great <laughs> It's a it's a, it's a page turner. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. So we'll be. Thank you very much. Be, we'll see this next month. Yes. Well, you'll see the final version the next month. And Ms. Vassal, if you can put this up on DocuShare for everybody, I'll, I'll make sure that you get the the latest and greatest. So copy. we will have to make a motion to accept that before it gets sent. Is that yes. is that the timeline on it? Mm -hmm. So the next one it'll be prettier. Prove it. Um, <laughs> and we'll have that. In color? <laughs> yeah, well <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Push it on. Thank you, Miss Allen. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Page. See you, Julie. You too. Next on the agenda is the Graysonville Elementary edition. Oh. Good evening. Hi, 
I'm here to talk about two items with you this evening. The first one is an introduction and an update to Graysonville Elementary School. Click out of this and just start with something else first. And So I have with me this evening Mr. Brad Hastings, who is part of the executive team. He's a design professional with Becker Morgan Group out of Salisbury, and he's going to help with more of the technical portions of this presentation for you. What we want to do this evening is to give you an introduction. This is the classroom addition project at Graysonville Elementary School and we want to review with you the schematic design documents that have been submitted to the state. Very preliminary work that we have done with this addition uh, and our schematic design to the state basically tells them that we are committed to moving forward. Our objectives tonight, we want to introduce the project scope. We'll talk about the execution of the project and also give you a timeline. We want to talk to you about any questions that you might have about the project. What we would be hoping for this evening is to get your approval on the schematic design submission that has gone to the state and then also to approve the design contract with Becker Morgan Group um, and I will explain a little bit more about how that process happened as well. So we issued an RFP in June and we sent this to architectural and engineering firms, anyone that was interested in submitting on our addition project. We asked them to give us a statement of qualifications. We received 15 proposals and they were ranked, they were rated and then narrowed down. The top four firms out of that process were invited to interview and Becker Morgan Group was the highest ranking architectural and engineering firm in that process. We've also begun the process of getting input. We've developed a planning and design committee, committee for this project that's comprised of community members and of staff, of parents, and they've all been invited to give us some feedback on this project and to participate as we start to work through the logistics of this project. We are, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this later when we talk about our CIP funding requests from the state. Um, we will be going to the state of Maryland to request partial funding for this project. Last year for our fiscal year 2017 requests, we currently have a state rated capacity at the school of 453. Last year we asked the state to allow us to build enough of an addition to increase that to 590. That means that the state would have been responsible for 50% of 6,220 square feet. That would have given us five classrooms, um, about 115 additional students for an overall total of 568. It's hard to see in this particular chart, but when we look out at our seven year projection for this school, and that's what the state asks us to do, look at this seven years ahead, we are targeting at 598 students. So this gets us close to the goal, not quite there. The state came back after our request last year and they have only given us at this point our approval for planning. This year we will be going back to request the actual funding and money in hand to build this addition. Again, current state rated capacity is 453. The state has looked at our request and said they think it's more logical for us to look at a population in this school of 536 because there may be available space at other schools. So now our job is to go back in a few months and to show them why we feel that is not in the best interest of our school system at this particular time. What, that, what the state at this point is saying they've committed to is 50% of 3,590 square feet, which essentially gives us 
50% funding for only three classrooms, 69 students, and 522 overall. So the numbers that we gave them last year okay. were trending at 598 for our seven year total, and this year we are up to 614 students in the next seven years. So we know that we have some work to do in convincing the state that we definitely have some capacity issues at that school. And we'll talk about that a little bit further uh, in the next presentation and also in the upcoming months. Our schedule. September 1st, I mentioned uh, the schematic design submission. The state requires that that is submitted on September 1st. We had hoped to delay that until after this meeting, and the state politely requested that we not do so. So that was submitted on September 1st. Mr. Hastings will go through that with you so that you have an understanding of what our preliminary ideas suggest. And then by November 1st, we have a design development submission that is due to the state. And again, it's, it's a little bit more technical. It gives them a little bit more information about what we're planning to do and develops the plan for this addition a little further. One other thing that I'd like to begin a conversation with you about is the type of delivery method that we are hoping to use for construction for this edition. It's called Construction Management at Risk, and it's worked very successfully with many of the other school systems in Maryland, and especially on the Eastern Shore. It's an alternative to a general contractor or to a traditional construction management type contract. It gives us the ability to select a construction manager that has the qualifications to manage not necessarily just the lowest price for who can build this addition for the lowest cost. The CMR, Construction Manager at Risk, is paid a management fee for their services, but they become a member of the collaborative team, so essentially they're a consultant throughout the entire process. They will centralize the responsibility of that construction under one contract, so they will still hold all of the responsibility to build this building, but they will give us a guaranteed maximum price <laughs> that we will pay for the project, and they will also give us an absolute date of completion. So that's where the term risk comes in. They are assuming the risk to be done on time and on budget. This format of delivery uh, historically has been more manageable we have a more predictable project. It saves time, it saves money, because you have a consultant that is reviewing this project from the very beginning from a cost and constructability standpoint. It helps reduce the risk to Queen Anne's County Public Schools, to the architect, and to the construction manager. With this, the construction manager at risk provides budgeting throughout the project. They provide cost estimating, scheduling, constructability review, and value engineering if necessary. So we can take out the surprises on bid day. That's the ultimate goal. They also do a pre-qualification of all of the subcontractors and will share that information with us so we know at all times who will be working on the project. It's not necessarily always who submitted the lowest price. It's who is most qualified and who is going to do the best work. They will also be providing all of the bonding. So as we move forward, we'll be talking about the construction manager at risk, but I wanted you to have an idea of what this process entails to see if you have questions as we go, and also just so you have an introduction to something, a, a different type of delivery method. So is this CMR actually gonna be the contractor? Yes. They are the manager that oversees <coughs> all of the subcontractors, so technically. You would still have uh, contractors, subcontractors under them doing the work. They would split it up into bid packages and contractors would be bidding on those. The CMR would be overseeing those, those contractors. Why is it you? Why don't you do it? On a project of such an expansive nature, it's number one, extremely time consuming. 
And number two, you need the specialty of someone who is in the industry every day that is tracking those numbers, tracking schedule. It's an expert in the field of construction that does nothing but construction related activities and would have the most up to date information. And if there's She'd still any be involved other. in it. Carla, exactly. Yeah. And handling it from the Queen Anne's County Public Schools side, but it would be the construction manager handling all of the individual subcontractors, much as a general contractor. That's would what I'm getting do. to. I think the yeah. important thing to realize is some of our past contracts, Queen Anne's County Public Schools has been holding, you know, the risk associated with this. And now we're removing that element from the contract and putting the risk back where it belongs and holding the contractors accountable for that and not always having the lowest bid, but the most qualified to do the job. It just sounds to me like it's another level that we're going to be paying for. You know, here's, here we have, just follow me, you have, no, we have you, and then we have a contractor, and now we have one more level that we have to pay, and just want to try and keep our costs. Isn't, isn't that person the contractor, though? It could replaces be. Replaces the contractor. Essentially replaces GC. the contractor, and please jump in at any point. It, it, <laughs> If you have a general contractor, typical design, bid, build, you have a general contractor that has a number of subcontractors under them. The construction manager at risk essentially replaces that general contractor and still has those other subcontractors under them. I think you all may have utilized construction manager advisor in the past where the district held multiple contracts. In this instance, you would only hold the one CMR contract that construction manager would hold all of those contracts themselves. They would be providing the project manager and a site superintendent and have all of those responsibilities that a general contractor would typically have, which I think may be what you're, you're thinking in terms of. Okay, thank you. One of the other benefits with construction management at risk is that we will have the opportunity to see all of the subcontractor bids that come in to see that pricing. And as part of the CMR fee, we then don't pay as much of a markup on the subcontractor prices. Part of their management fee is handled. It, it handles their markup. So to a degree, there's a trade-off. With the general contractor, you're getting their markup on all the services, whereas we're paying someone up front from the construction management side. They're showing us the exact numbers and then not adding as much of a markup on that end. And they're assuming the risk. Exactly. And that's why with everyone that I've spoken to in other counties in Maryland, that is the part that has really been beneficial. And we'd be happy to get references from other counties as well as we start to talk about this. So you can hear what they have to say about using this type of method. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brad. Remember, again, that these are very preliminary ideas. This is the schematic submission that we're going to discuss. The intent is to get the project registered with the state at this point to let them know that we are moving forward with it. Um, the information that you got in the agenda, it's very technical. And Brad's going to try and break some of that down. Good evening. Please stop me at any time if you've got any questions and we'll try and walk you uh, through this. We'll give a little bit of background information and then show you what the schematic design submission was and a few of the challenges that we're, we're looking at here. So our design team is led by Becker Morgan Group. We're architecture, uh, civil engineering and surveyors on this project. We have uh, Morocco Consultants is our structural engineer. Guype Associates is our mechanical, electrical and plumbing engineers and ESP is our technology and security consulting. So it's a team effort in putting all of this together and going forward with the design team. The overview of the services, and as you heard Carla mention, 
before. We're really at the early stages of the entire design process. We've been working on the educational specification and the schematic design submission to the state. As you can see here, it continues on to the design development phase, construction document phase, and then we go into bidding and off those construction documents and then move into construction. So we're in the, the early stages of the, the project. Schedule-wise, as you can see here, the overall schedule, and again, we've been working on the ed spec and the SD phase here, and we made that submission on the 1st of September. We were hoping, as uh, was mentioned, to push that back, but couldn't do that, and so that brings us here to today, looking for your uh, approval there. A couple of highlights of things looking forward. The DD phase takes us to the end of October in order to make the IEC's requirement for the DD submission on November 1st. So we still have a, uh, a bit of time, but it, it goes quickly as well. So we don't have uh, a lot of time to, to mess around moving forward. Meetings to date, we had a, a very busy August, as you can see here, and we appreciated the, uh, the time and effort and the input we received from the, the various folks there that were in the planning committee meetings and some of the other uh, meetings that we had uh, getting things kicked off, especially with school starting. It was a busy time for everybody, so we appreciated everyone's working with us on their schedule. But all of these efforts took place in order for us to get here uh, this evening and to make that schematic design input. The program of the building itself, and this is the space summary that you see here. We have some uh, work in the kitchen area, uh, looking at providing a new manager's office, new walk-in cooler and freezer and uh, custodial closet in that space. Then we have some shared resource spaces, uh, tutoring comments similar to what's existing there in uh, Graysonville now, storage area, staff toilets, some student toilets, as well as hopefully a uh, space for a conference room, which came out of some of the input we were receiving in those early meetings. And then the, the critical portion there, the five classrooms, all of those pieces together brought us to about uh, 8,000, just a little under 8,000 square feet uh, proposed. And that's taking both these net square footages, which are the spaces that are required, as well as adding in uh, the unprogrammed square feet, which takes us to the gross. That includes your corridors, your walls, chases, and that, and that type of uh, space there. So the existing school uh, site plan, which you all are probably familiar with, there we, we looked at options, and again, a lot of times it comes, oh, it's easy, we'll just uh, stick a little addition onto, onto the existing facility and, and move on, never quite uh, that, that simple. And after looking at a couple of the options, really the only options for uh, additions were out the back, either in this area or possibly this area. This this photo doesn't show all of the existing uh, portables that are in place, so this really wasn't in play close to the stormwater management and it would impact those portables as well. So we started looking at the the area up at the top of the, uh, the screen, which allows us access out of that existing corridor there. So there are a few things that come into play there. You've got an existing water line back there, which feeds a, uh, a hydrant, which is located uh, right, out, right out back there in this location. Got the playground, as you can see there, which will need to, which would be impacted by this addition. There's a fire marshal access road, which uh, comes down and, and across there. So that comes into play, as well as some storm drain lines that are in, in place there. So all of these pieces started to come into play as we were looking at the options, as well as, I didn't have it marked on here, but we have the grease interceptor outside the kitchen area there and the impacts that that could have on additions to the kitchen area. So out of that, our initial uh, proposal is looking at the classroom addition in that general area. It allows us hopefully to avoid impacts to the storm drain and the water line, as well as the fire marshal's access road by keeping it tight to the building there. We do have to relocate the playground areas, but as you can see here, those could be relocated and still have room for a soccer field out in the open area there as well. 
So we zoom in and take a look at what the addition actually would entail and we'd be tying in in two locations where the existing corridor comes out and currently comes out to where the playground space is as well as tying back into the cafeteria area at this corridor here. So we have the five classroom spaces located around a central uh, toilet facility here, the little storage area, and then that conference room alternate that uh, was listed there. And we'd have egress or exiting, continuing that corridor out this way, as well as a new exit out this way. And then at the kitchen, <clears throat> looking to try and provide that office space directly outside the existing uh, access to the kitchen, as well as the walk-in uh, cooler and freezer back in that area there. That's a question real fast. Yes. Sid, is that going to be the same size um, walk-in refrigerator that we have at the other schools? It should be comparable. And the other part he hasn't mentioned is that's the only kitchen that the poor ladies cook in. There's no air conditioning. There's none. In that. And part of the so plan small. is to include air conditioning yeah, why in we, that. Why aren't we doing more on that kitchen than that? I mean, because there's just no space. Well, once you remove, you're going to be, once you remove all the reach-in freezers and refrigerators, it's going to open up a lot more space for them to have in there because everything is now reach-in and the poor ladies, they, they have no space One of the freezers right now is in the cafeteria area. Mm -hmm. They don't have enough space. Very tight. I'll mention now. Sorry, that, thank you. Oh, I'm, no, I'm sorry. Absolutely. Uh, we're looking at two spaces as potential alternates, again, based on how the budget goes, one of those being a classroom space and one of those being this conference room space, and I'll touch on that a little uh, more as we go forward. So this uh, is a 3D view uh, looking at the back of the school there. Hopefully might make this uh, a little bit more uh, easy to understand. So this addition would go onto the back. You have the existing music rooms there, your cafeteria space is here, and this is the kitchen space and the service yards that are out, out there. So we're looking at adding the addition in this area. So you can see it would start to, to come out. Those classroom spaces would be here. This would be the office addition just outside the kitchen area. The walk-in right outside there is, as well and tying back in. And then this would be what it would potentially look like trying to tie it in with the rest of the, the facility there with those those classrooms in this this area here that would be the extension of the kitchen and that would be the walk-in space there budget looking at that uh, square footage and uh, with the potential cost for building and site and a construction contingency we're at about uh, a little over $3 million for the construction cost, and then looking at additional almost a, a million dollars in soft costs there, so we're a little over $4.1 million right now is our initial schematic design estimate. As you can tell, and as we said, we're very early in the process, so there are a lot of unknowns still to be resolved, but this is our, our thought at this, this point in time. The additions are not included in that? That is the addition. That, yes, I, mean the, I mean the add-ons, add the, alternates, are they included? The in alternates that? are included in that square footage now, yes ma'am. And how about we the relocation of the, the fields? Yes. That's okay. That's within all, all that, the building and the site cost. We're going to get rid of the portables though, right? Yes, I mean, that's... Is that a savings? Were they hours? We, we purchased the portables many, I shouldn't say many years ago, about three or four years ago, we had a ton of portables that we leased. Mm -hmm. And what we've done over the past is dwindle those down to the amount that we've leased because the market was kind of flooded with portables and we were able to purchase some um, with say our portable account or fund balance to knock that down. So really, I believe it's two, Tony? One, two. one portable that we're only leasing now not at Graysonville, but one portable in the whole right. entire county. So we own those. We, we own those. Um, and part of the, not to steal any thunder from them, but part of the issue is going to be is convincing the state that, hey, the need for the population is here. I mean, it's a, <coughs> it's a numbers game with them, but, you know, what we don't want to see is having five portables there, building this addition, and then we get back up to, um, you know, 600 students, and then portables. we need the portables right back. And I mean, right. this just isn't Queen Anne's County. I mean, this is, he can tell you, and Carla can tell you, this is the state with every county goes through. But it's making a good pitch and a good sale to the state about, hey, you know, we have these portables, we're moving away from them. We don't want the portables to come back in just, you know, six more years, because we can, sh you know, show you what the information looks like, so. 
had this problem with the high school. Yeah. It was only built for 960 students, and we dropped 1,200 the very first day of school at Kent Island. I mean, this has been going on forever. And that's, that, that's the state's formula. I mean, it's trying to convince them. So why did you pick those two things as as ad we, we were just, and, and I'll talk about some of the ad alternates here now, and we were just looking at potential ad alternates. One of them is the geothermal system, which would be part of the heating, ventilation, and cooling. We're looking at two potential systems now, an air-cooled system and a geothermal system. The geothermal could be an ad alternate. It would be a more expensive system, more efficient, but more costly. That can be an alternate, so we can have a bid that we think will give us the price to get us in on bid day, but then hopefully an uh, improved system that we know will cost more, we'll get a price for it, and hopefully we can afford to do that at the time. But it's it's kind of weighing what your budget will allow versus... It'll cost more up front, but then the, it'll be cheaper there's, in the long run. Similar, yes. huh? Similar to what we did at Kennard Elementary. Similar to what we did at Kennard Elementary. Right, right. Okay. So the geothermal system was one of the options. The classroom, again, was was one that was put up there when you're looking at a small project like this, if you're looking to save money, one of the only things you can do is look at square footage and a classroom is significant square footage. So that was one of the items of discussion. The conference room space, as I mentioned there, the HVAC at the kitchen, you no, know, you, you want that, but again, just cost driven. So those, those are just items that we're putting out there right now, depending on how the budget goes and the funding is available that could be reduced. Can I ask one more thing? Yeah. With this increase in student population, why aren't we also doing something about the nurses' station? You know, the nurses, I mean, it's like a closet. We, we could possibly put that on as a add on. I mean, just to see. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, you have to think about that. There are also some potential internal renovations that we've looked at in the office area. The staff mentioned that they were very lacking in conference space because a lot of their conference space is turned into office space for some of their specialists. There are ways in some of the existing rooms that we could probably carve out better conference area space with Queen Anne's County Public Schools uh, forces as opposed to doing it through this contract. And the nurses station is in that area as well that has some potential for increase if necessary. The other thing that Brad and I have discussed just as recently as today in looking at our numbers and the fact that they have gone even over 600 at this point, are we better off to look at a base bid of five classrooms with the alternate as the sixth classroom instead? But again, we know that from last year we had difficulty convincing the state that our enrollment should be that high. We're not sure at this point how the state is going to receive that when we meet with them in October. I, I, I was exactly what I was going to recommend you do. I mean, we to go back like we did at at Stevensville and try to pay for alternates and vote on alt you know, add on add alternate. I mean, you clearly have a need yes. for five classrooms at, at minimum. I, w I don't know why we're even going to breathe that that's an alternative. And that's the point that we have come to as well. Um, we also want to take this to the commissioners to have them take a look because we know the cost that they were anticipating, what they were anticipating receiving from the state is not necessarily as much as we had hoped based on the information that we got from them last year. So what do you need from us tonight? So what we need tonight, we would like an approval of the schematic design submission. What you've seen here just as our preliminary starting point with some of the changes that we've talked about coming in the near future. And the second thing I'd like to discuss with you, there was a memo that was in your packet this evening um, that is the AE Design Services Contract Award for Becker Morgan Services and to have an approval of their fee to move forward with their contract. I did have one thing. The LEED certification, I thought that was a requirement now on all new stuff. It is a requirement now for all new construction, but when we talked with the state, the size of this 
addition didn't qualify to have to be LEED certified. We will be designing it, though, so that it will be more energy efficient and up to LEED standards. We just won't be pursuing the certification since it's a small addition. Okay, thanks. I need to ask where's, where's the 262 coming from, Robin? Do we have that in construction costs or if, for this contract? For this contract, uh, it's part of the planning money. Yes. Uh, we have we it. Have it yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's yeah, what I'm asking. She's talking yes. about. I'm sorry. Right yeah, it's right. Just wondering. Bless you. So, one, um, we need a motion to approve the schematic design submission. Now, the cart before the horse, don't we have to Thank you. get their contract first before we do this design? I'm sorry, I'm just looking for the... Thank you. Is the schematic design... No, isn't the schematic design separate from the AE design services? Yes. Yes. Okay, so that's why we need a motion to approve the schematic design submission. Anyone? So moved. Move. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Do I have any questions or comments regarding the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote to approve the schematic design submission. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Next, we need a motion for the approval of the AE design services fee to move forward with their contract. So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? Hearing none, I call for the approval of the AE Design Services um, of their fee to move forward with their contract. All in favor say aye. Excuse me. Uh, just to clarify, Becker Morgan Group. The Becker Morgan Group from Salisbury, Maryland. We have to put their name in the motion. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so let's. So we need a motion for the Becker Morgan Group's AE Design Services fee or for approval to move forward with their contract of 262 $262,500. So moved. I have a motion to have a second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote for the Becker Morgan Group AE Design Services for approval of their fee of $262,500 to move forward with their contract. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, the ayes have it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, I think you all very your much. your schematic thank that you. you're sending forward, that's what you're taking to the state, right? Yes. Now, does that leave any room to put in, if we said yes, five classrooms and alternate sixth, is there somewhere to put the sixth one in there? Yes. Do we have to yeah, We actually before? talked about that today. We're gonna come up with a plan that shows that okay. as well. All right. Thank so you. you meet with them again in October. So we need a timeline. October, you'll meet with them again in the state. In October, we will meet with them for funding requests. <coughs> and I'm going to talk to you next about the capital improvement plan okay. and what we're doing moving forward with that. Okay. Our next submission in regard to Graysonville specifically to the state is November 1st. Okay. So that will, we will need to be closer to our decision if not at the decision for the number of classrooms at that time, because it gets much harder to retroactively design the building at that point. So the January meeting where you go before them, will, that, will Graysonville be a part of that discussion? Yes. Okay. It will. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. you. All very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Excited Thank to be a part of it. We'll be <laughs> seeing you. <laughs> Next presentation is the FY 2018 Public School Construction Capital Improvement Plan. So now we get to talk about our request to the state for funding. Tonight I just want to give you an outline of the CIP just as a reminder what it is, why we do it. Uh, we want to talk about how the state of Maryland actually calculates the funding requests what happens with the CIP requests when, 
and what we see as the highest priorities for our fiscal year 2018 requests for funding. We'll review the upcoming schedule and requirements. We want to prepare for a discussion at the September 20th work session where you will have a draft copy of the full CIP submission. And our submission is due to the state by October 5th, 2016. So a few months ago, I was here to talk about the Educational Facilities Master Plan, which was step one in the required documents that we submit to the state every year. The EFMP is a long range plan. It reviews our enrollment projections. It helps us to start prioritizing those facility needs. And the facility assessment that we've been discussing for many months has been helpful in this process too. Now we're gonna talk about the capital <coughs> improvement plan, which is step number two, which also looks at the upcoming fiscal year and the type of funding requests we feel we'll need. It looks at projects in future years as well. So not only do we know what to expect, but the state does as well. We start to establish some timelines for each of these projects, prioritize each of the facilities needs, and then to look at what local funding and state funding needs are gonna be. We prioritize projects usually based on age and building conditions, any type of life safety issues. Major capital projects consist of projects that, two, that are $200,000 or more, and we look at those whether they are eligible for state funding or not. Some are not. Our minor capital projects are usually up to $200,000, and many of those are locally funded as opposed to receiving state funding. This may look familiar. It's part of the Comar regulations that we discussed last time for the Educational Facilities Master Plan. For the Capital Improvement Plan, we have many of the same regulations. Every year, by the date the IAC specifies, we need to submit them this request to them for funding if we want to take our piece of the pie for fiscal year 2018. The cost share formula. Fiscal year 18, Queen Anne's County Public Schools has a 50% cost share percentage with the state. A lot of times it doesn't necessarily work out to be a true 50-50 split as I'm sure you recall from future projects and that is due to certain items that aren't necessarily eligible for state funding but that we determine as a school system are necessary to do within the project and we request that from our local funding sources. The state cost allowance, unfortunately, has gone down 6% this year. We are seeing building costs rising probably as much as that. So we're not sure where the state has developed these formulas from and that will be one of our questions when we meet with them in October. The way, the, the way the state cost share formula between counties, you'll see that there's quite a variance as to what certain counties pay and what the state covers on their behalf. It's a very complicated formula, but it has to do with uh, each county's participation in certain state programs, their percentages of free and reduced lunches, unemployment rates in the county, per capita income, and population growth. When we look at how the state calculates what we are eligible for, the local school system determines our projected enrollments. We do that with both the county and state, and we submitted that with our Educational Facilities Master Plan earlier this year. The state then gives us a square foot per student, and that in the purple circle on the right gives us the eligible project building size. The state says this is how big your addition, your project should be. Step two of that is that they take that building size times the state cost per square foot that we just discussed that went down 6% and that gives us our eligible construction costs. Looking at schedule, everything is intertwined between this process as well. You remember that we submitted our Educational Facilities Master Plan in July. Our Capital Improvement Plan, we're looking for an October 5th submission, so we are hoping for your approval. Uh, 
We were hoping to do it at the October 5th meeting, but I do understand that that has been postponed. So we will be looking at an alternative method between now and the time we see you on September 21st. And then in March, of course, we go to the county government after we have received um, confirmation from the state as to what they will be providing and we make our request to the county. Priorities for fiscal year 2018. This was uh, a form that you received with the agenda packet last week and it not only looks at what our projected projects are for 2018, but we go out through 2023 with what we anticipate will be our top priorities. For fiscal year 2018, we will be requesting of the state and of the county the funding for the construction to the Graysonville Elementary School addition project. We've also prioritized the uh, energy management system and fire alarm upgrades for Ken Island High School. Sudlersville Elementary School, we are looking for a partial roof replacement as well as exterior door replacements. These are all important to the building envelope of that school. And for Bayside Elementary School, we are in need of an upgraded generator. If you look at the classifications below, we determine our needs and our priorities based on life safety, whether it's a building envelope issue, if it's a capacity issue, such as Graysonville Elementary, if we're looking for better energy efficiency, or if it's a systemic replacement. So what do we have to do now? On September 21st, we're going to bring you the draft of this CIP document that we'll be sending to the state. It is going to give you way too much information about the five projects that we just listed. A lot of it is very technical because that's what the state requires, <coughs> but we want you to have an opportunity to review that. We'll be making that final document then available for review with submission to the state by October 5th. October 18th, the state has set aside time for our county to meet with them in regard to our submission. And then by November 28th, we will be doing any amendments necessary to our CIP request and we'll be asking the county for a letter of their financial support for our request as well. And those are all requirements of the state for us to move forward with this process. Are there any questions so far about our CIP submission or any of the requirements that we are made to do for this document? Yes, ma'am. Um, page eight, do you have the list of our priorities? What is a Queen Anne's High School parapet? What's that? This is the wall that extends above the roof line at Queen Anne's County High School. And if I'm not mistaken, it's around the cafeteria auditorium area where we've had your auditorium and gymnasium. Lots of roofing issues so it's in ma that area. Maintenance issue. Yes. Maintenance issue. Yes. If you're where we came up with some of these, um, also was meeting with the maintenance department staff and especially Jim O'Donnell and Tony Schultz, so we could get a well-rounded idea of what items we were looking at, not only just from the building but also from the, the you know kitchen, the cafeteria kind of things. But that there is in you know needs assistance in that. Was area. that it? That and how did you incorporate the analysis we did on the maintenance <coughs> assessment into this? In so that played in heavily into these priorities okay. because that facility assessment lets us take a look at the useful life for many of these systems. They also reviewed things like the parapet wall where they saw leaking or evidence of issues with maintenance. So we were able to tie in the dates that they were thinking the work needed to be done <coughs> along with our assessment of when the work needed to be done and put these into priority. It's also a great tool in terms of cost. We were able to take some of the numbers that we had, <coughs> compare it with the numbers that they've given us and, and get a more true picture 
of what our potential costs will be in the upcoming years. And keep in mind, these are just projects that the state is going to fund. I mean, we also use the facility assessment to help us get a list that we're going to request from the county commissioners. Like, the state's not going to pay for any kind of painting. They're not going to pay for um, site work as far as the uh, parking lots, the bus drop-offs. So we have a whole separate list that we'll go through. And it, the facility assessment was really a great, great tool to use. It saved a lot of time and effort. Well, the other thing is you've got four years down the line before, well, this is 2018, I'm sorry, before you do a feasibility plan on the career and technology item. Um, that impacts several items below that. Yes. Um, and all the portables at the high schools and blah, you know. Is that the earliest we could input that feasibility study? Because, you know, that's very beginning phases of solving many of our capacity issues. Yes, it is. And no, that isn't the earliest that we can fit that in. It was actually pushed out another year this year. Um, mainly, and this precedes me a little bit, um, but just in terms of county funding and I believe within the school system there are also a number of decisions that we probably have to make and involve curriculum and some other departments before we can move forward with the direction that we want to go there and have a better idea. And I understood that was the feasibility study. What's going to be looking well, at all of that? You'll have the feasibility study, but also we need to gather and meet with curriculum to decide what That's exactly right. classes do they want to have there. I mean, are they do they want to have, you know, um, marine uh, diesel do they want to have you know what kind of carpentry and that's going to drive a lot of this with the curriculum and then you're also going to have to look at the student population of you know I'm sorry but I thought that's what this the whole study was about what are we going to do are we going to put an addition here we're going to put it here we're going to build a CTE well that will, I, that will uh, then incorporate into the feasibility study of hey what is the best viable option of you know should we build it here should we build it there I mean because we have to have all that information of what classes we're going to have and what we're going to offer mm -hmm. before we can even get a, a, a number on that. Um, so I mean, why did we, we, that why did we delay that then? That because of not having curriculum input to it? Is that what you're, well, we what can, you're saying? No, we can still move this. This this is just a draft. We can still right, move things very around preliminary. here if you want. This, um, but we need to keep it on there somewhere as a placeholder with the state oh, yeah. because if you take it off, the state's going to say, uh, you took it off last year, why do you need it back this year? So, I mean, it's just a placeholder, and this is a um, you okay. know, moving okay. document All we right, can move around you. on. I see we took off the uh, Route 8 South Elementary School. Yes. So, Mrs. Schultz and I were able to sit down with the county. Uh, we have it, 14. It's number 14. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I did I'm right over that. After we make this decision on. Right. Back um, in Ann's high school. I clipped right over there. No, that's okay. School. And just as an update, yeah. we were able to speak with some of the county officials when we heard that the Route 8 project was moving forward because that was one of our concerns. What type of growth enrollment are we looking at as this construction project starts to finish? The number that they gave us as their projection is in the 140s. That's preliminary. They believe that what will happen initially is that the uh, lots that have not been able to be built on will then see new properties and that will uh, give us the overall student total of in the area of 140. Over time what they explained to us was that they expect that people will then be doing additions. It may likely be bringing larger families into some of the communities down Route 8 where some of the houses that have not been able to accommodate additions at this point were housing smaller families. So they do expect an increase in growth, just not immediately. And this is also, I believe, a three-year construction project. So we do still have it on our radar, but not necessarily as early as we had expected. But we have all that construction going on at the top of Route 8 right now. The, the condos that are going up, has anyone said what kind of influx we're going to get from that? Those are the new ones. The, the new development, Yes. That's for age restricted, 55 and over. But. I mean, Tony meets with the Department of Planning quite frequently to discuss. There's no, there's no influx with that. 
the dirt. Not the dirt. Not the dirt. That. Okay. Wondering if we have to absorb some of the Graysonville kids when our schools are already at capacity. Now, I will tell you that from our conversations with the state from last year, uh, it was our preference not to have the Ken Island schools included in that uh, potential for redistricting, and the state was on board with that. The state was looking specifically at the Centerville area schools that do have some capacity and that are trending downward in numbers. We have some justifications as to why we don't feel that's the best idea at this point. Uh, one for transportation issues, and that's what we plan to take to the state on October 18th and give them our justifications. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about taking our kindergartners from Graysonville all the way to Centerville. That's. Oh, well. And I will tell you, the state, they have still. changed a lot of positions there. I mean, Dr. Lever is no longer there. He was in charge of the construction, so it's a whole nother gamut of individuals that you know we're working with now you know about that but one of the items like Ms. Carla said was a you know what is the cost of transportation if we're going to have to how many buses are we going to have to get now if we want to transport those students over there because it's not simply you know Graysonville Elementary School at the split there those kids attend there well now all of a sudden we're going to take them and you know awesome. transport them bus them all the way to Centerville I mean from. so having she went from. sure I mean, having the justification to present that to them, so. Another piece would be not having students spend on the bus because we try to keep sure. that in minimum. Right. Yeah. Mm. Any other questions, comments? Do we need a motion to accept this? No, this was mm -hmm. just for your information. Wow. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Cool Next on the agenda is the individual action items, which is the first thing is the HR report. Um, just going to make a motion to accept the HR report as presented in closed session. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? Hearing none, I call for the approval of the HR report as presented in closed session. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. The ayes have it. Next is the teacher ESP support contract extension are we making a motion for a 30-day extension yes is that what's the recommendation yeah I just mr. Farley mr. Farley yes we can't extension of contract. we can't can't we just approve the ones that we agree with I mean are, are they they all have to be done or they all don't get done they all just I, don't get done. I, I can't answer your question at the moment. Sorry I asked. Make a motion to extend the teacher ESP and support contracts for another 30 days. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? Hearing none, I call for the extension of the teacher's ESP and support contracts for 30 days. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. Next is there are five policies for their third and final read. Um, the military policy on policies, Title IX, child abuse, and non-discrimination. Was there any comments on the site regarding those, Mr. Farley? With regard to the military policy, there was a comment that someone felt we should also consider a uh, firefighter, police officer experience as relevant. Um, <clears throat> Bear with me one second. Okay. And there was a um, a caution by a commenter that a lot of policies are being viewed and to be careful. Okay. Okay. I remember that um, Captain Kelly had made a a um, statement about some wording that was in the military one. Has that been resolved? No. Um, I just recommend, let me just give you the sentence under page 1, B6, where it says the individual must have been released from service under honorable conditions. That's confusing. I just, we should just say what it is. The individual must have been released from service with an honorable discharge. 
That's all you got to say, with an honorable discharge. That's fine. Okay. And the other one is, in, 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 I think we really shouldn't move this one forward yet. I think we ought to consider what the um, public comment was made. I think we should move it forward to where, from this point on, you have the system in here of how you, you want to up them. But I think we should take another look at retro, the retroactive and how many you give and, and maybe get a good idea of how many people we're right. talking about, which, I mean, I know other people that aren't those four guys that came out here, other people that are military, and maybe we, we need to go out and get clear of how many people we're talking about and come up with a recommendation on the number of years you serve and at what point you get one or two or three steps. I, I'd like an, a recommendation from you and your staff on that. I I that's can becomes make a that budget issue, Captain yeah. Kelly, and we need to. That's I'd I mean. like we to need see to the find numbers. out what that number is, which I don't have that number. We don't have that number. We don't know at this point, Captain Kelly, and we need to find out. We also need to determine the fiscal impact of uh, of the proposal. So I would like to do some research and come back to you if great. I may. Great, that's great. And so I are would we like to also thank okay. the, um, the military. military veterans uh, that are our teachers for coming out tonight. Thank you all. Okay. So do we need a motion to table the military policy? No, we're just setting them out mm -hmm. for a third read anyway. Okay. It's not, it's not, we're not voting on them as a final. They're just going out for a third read. All of them. Okay. Well, but so. that one we might end up Change. changing. So I'd say we just pull it off the table right now and get that analysis. I recommend. So do we need to make a motion on that? I don't think you should pull it off the table because you're just amending it. It, would that, does that fall under more of a procedure versus the policy? That's the, my, uh, the, with the military one, I'm just, if we pull it, our, our, is what Captain Kelly is recommending, is that more of the procedural view of the policy or, or are we recommending, or is that the policy itself? The policy is, I believe, that we want to recognize the experience gathered through military service. Uh, and of the procedure would be the application of that policy and, and how, how, it's structured. It, how it is actually right. carried out. And so I believe it would be a procedure. Okay, so we could, uh, but we make a choice. We make a decision on that because it has budgetary impact. That's, That's what I correct. mean. So I think it still falls under okay. policy. I just want to make but sure. But then they what implement it with a procedure. Correct. Okay. okay. Correct. Yeah, so I at this time we're going to table the military policy. Is that what you want to do? Recommending. Is yes. that until we can get more? They information. make a motion. Okay, I move we table this until we get further information and go forward with it after explain that. What you're, explain what you're tabling. Table of military, <laughs> military um, service policy. Second. No, okay, I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote to table the military policy um, at this time. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Um, I need a motion to put the four the four policies out for the third and final read, which would be the policy on policies, Title IX, child abuse, and non-discrimination. So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? Just one thing on the... Um, I'd like you to just look at that, and, and, and you need to add at the end of... Um, I had that A7 add or gender identity in there. We've, we've left that out for discrimination. Title Thank nine. You. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, can I have a motion to put those out for the third and final read? We have a motion and a second. Okay, on thank you. So we have a vote. Mm -hmm. I call for the vote to put the policy on policies, Title IX, child abuse and non-discrimination non policies out for a third and final read. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, the ayes have it. We have three field trips um, that we need to approve. The first one is Queen Anne's County High School FFA to North Bay, October 7th to October 9th. May I make a recommendation, ma'am? Can we just do? I'm doing them all together right now. Awesome, thank you. Um, the Alpha Batismo Primo Service Learning Group to Washington, D.C. and the Queen Anne's County High School Marching Band to Hershey Stadium, October 30th through 31st. I need a motion to approve those. So moved. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? 
I call for the vote to approve the following field trips, Queen Anne's County High School FFA to North Bay, the Alpha Batismo Primo Service Learning Group to Washington, D.C., and Queen Anne's County High School Marching Band to Hershey Park. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, the ayes have it. Um, next is the transportation report, um, the 2016-2017 substitute bus drivers. Yes, this is just the annual approval of the 64 substitute bus drivers um, meeting the qualifications set forth by the state of Maryland with their in-service training and also their uh, physicals that they've completed. Okay. I need an hour no. substitute bus drivers? Or are they some for? of them are hours and some of them are LLCs. Okay. It just states Thank that you. we have all the proper paperwork in place for that. You recommend all of them? Yeah. Can I have a motion, can I have a motion to approve the 2016-2017 substitute bus drivers? I moved. I have a motion to have a second. Second. A motion and a second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote to approve the 2016-2017 substitute bus drivers. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, the ayes have it. Future action items, a policy for the curricular expense for students in education that is multicultural program out for a second read. Is there any comments? I guess Mr. Farley is no longer in here. I don't recall that there were any comments on those two policies on their second read. Okay. I need a motion for the curricular expense for students and education that is multicultural program to go out for its second read. Moved. I have a motion to have a second. second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? I have a question. Mm -hmm. Multicultural, um, all the discussion on multicultural proficiency and uh, committee and all that. Is that only geared to African American or multicultural is Hispanic? Absolutely. Is it, it is is all cultures, all all of them. All Are they participating diversity. in the breakfasts? Because I watch them at Bay Times and it's I don't see anything but African American and it, it, uh, it I know at the the last Sunday I think Miss Paul's attended one of the most recent Sunday suppers. I remember we attended the first Sunday supper. Um, uh, but I think it was the, the whole notion of that is around diversity, not specifically um, around any particular culture. So are, are we embracing the representatives that yes. are also Hispanic, not yes. just African American? Yes. Okay, thank you. They have been invited. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, so. So moved. Thank you. I have a motion of a second. Second. I call for the vote to put the curricular expense for students and education that's multicultural program out for a second read. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, the ayes have it. Next is a first read on three policies. The first one being gang, gang activity and similar destruction, destructive or illegal group behavior, media material selection guidelines and the cell phone policy. Um, anybody have any questions before we, or comments? I did on um, cell phone uh, policy. I'm glad we're redoing that one. Um, there, uh, the Queen Anne's County High School students put out a petition requesting we change the current policy. I don't know if you guys have been aware of that, to allow students to look at their cell phones in the hallways between classes and at lunch. Um, they have over 500 signatures, but I was reading the petition today, and the student that initiated it. Um, they were irritated that the current pr principal is enforcing the rule, and um, but the person who initiated it said they understand thoroughly that the principal was doing the job correctly. Um, they closed out the position because they figured the board has now been made aware of it, so they're happy. That was their goal, was to make us aware of the request from over 500 people who signed the petition from Queen Anne's County High School. So we need to think about their input that they provided, why the reasons they had it. And it's all on the, um, it's on this, the website for the um, petition. It's called change.org. So I recommend we take a look at that and think about um, maybe adjusting, if not both middle school and high school, maybe just the high school one, if we feel that that is correct. The background to this is we decided to, and I notice you're still doing an annual, because this is a, um, this is uncharted territories for us over the years. So as we improve how we're doing this and get, and we do get feedback every year sure. from teachers, students, um, sure. 
I think we ought to, you know, analyze this one pretty, pretty clearly. No, I, I think it's exactly right. And 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 to that, the uh, the uh, implementation of that policy at Queen Anne's County High School, as it's currently written, is being implemented as Correct. it relates to the policy. Correct. However, I do recall uh, last year that the board had requested that we look at the cell phone policy annually. Right. So. Perfect timing in in looking at this and seeking feedback. Uh, I've also received feedback from parents. Matter of fact, I spoke with two parents today, uh, specifically on this issue, and and three students as well. So okay. we're going to take it back, and we're going to certainly work with um, our staff and collect input. Um, it'll be out for public read for three times. We'll collect all that community input, and then we'll look at bringing you back recommendations based upon all that feedback. And we actually did do a survey, and I don't know if we need to do that again, but we did a thorough survey. Um, I, I do recall that. Because originally the, the, the angst was with the, the sheriff's department, as I recall, because of um, cyberbullying going on. Um, yes. So, you know, so maybe input from them, too, because they, they were very strong on the fact they should not be allowing them, period. So... Just keep that in mind, that's come some in the background. They also working. made reference to the fact that during fire drills and bomb threats that the students need to stay off their phones. Mm -hmm. um, it, I mean, that has to affect our safety issues. Right. But, but do consider that, that petition with some thoughts that they had on there. Of course. So, thank you. So, okay, so yeah. I need a motion to put out the three policies, gang, gang activity, and similar destructive and illegal group behavior, media material selection guidelines, and cell phone policy out for the first read. So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote to put out three policies, gang, gang activity, and similar destructive and illegal group behavior, media <coughs> material selection guidelines, and cell phone policy out for the first read. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, the ayes have it. Next on the agenda is the report starting off with the superintendent's report. So just three quick items. Uh, number one, we finished out at the beginning of August with our meet and greets, and as a result of that, we're creating a parent advisory cabinet, and we're so excited. We have uh, nearly 60 parents that have signed up for that. So uh, the deadline to sign up is this Friday, and then we'll take that information and start putting together a schedule. So we're very excited about getting direct input uh, from parents. Second, we've had... Excuse me, is that every parent? Because I've had some parents call me, and will that be a selection will you pare that down or will the whole the whole whoever signs up I think that's a, I, I think that's a that, that's a great question one of the things that we're looking at is because there's so many parents that have wanted to participate right. is maybe breaking them into small groups so that way that parents that have wanted to participate can participate right, right. we'll also hold those in the evenings there's a couple of parent questions etc right. are they during the day or in the evening it's, that's we'll right. make them in the evening so it's more accessible right. for parents right. uh, they'll be at different locations and and right now we're thinking probably an hour Right. As a good, maybe hour, no more than an hour and a half, but at least uh, I think it's important for us as a school system that we allow parents that have access and we're and not saying yeah. it's only a selected group. Right, that was so if, if was, we need to do yeah. three of them, I'm more than right. willing to do three of them. And that's what I told As long parents as parents, that, yeah. we, we want to make sure that they feel that they have an opportunity to express right. their concerns. So I think it would be great may feedback. May I interject for just a moment? Could we please let our two student board members leave? They have school. That's fine. It's I mean, cool. we're, we'll be done in like sure. 10 minutes, yeah, but can they go fine. ahead and leave? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I know school you're tomorrow. This one. <laughs> I'm sure they have homework. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we got into the moment. <laughs> So that's a great segue for my second update, which is a great opening of school week that we had. So we can't forget about that. We've opened up with a great school year. Um, one of the things I think has been exciting for us as an executive team, each of us rode a bus on the first day of school. So it was great to see students and parents excited and uh, very excited to see how many photographs parents were taking of the first day of school pictures uh, as they were getting on the bus. So I think we've had a great opening of school. I've had a chance to visit each school with each principal. Uh, 
and touch base with them during that first week. I know Ms. Pauls has been out as well, uh, as well as other exec staff. So we've had a great first week. The last update that I want to, to say, which is a very, very celebratory, and that is with uh, Ms. Forte being uh, announced uh, as a state teacher of the year finalist that she will compete with seven other uh, teacher of the year finalist, which will be in October. So we're very excited. To, uh, that is uh, certainly certainly kudos to her, uh, the faculty at uh, Church Hill, and I think that is a great marker for us as a school system. October seventh. October seventh. Thank you. Good night. Um, next would be the curriculum and instruction report. Is Miss Paul's doing that? Yes. Yes, she is. Evening. All right. Good evening. So to abbreviate, in the month that I've been here, um, the supervisors, coordinators, and facilitators have been very, very, very busy. I think the highlight would be the back to school activities, the professional development activities that were offered to new teachers and to all staff returning. I uh, was very well received. The feedback was extremely positive and many of the supervisors themselves conducted the sessions and they have been hard at work. So we really got off to a great start. Um, mm -hmm. And again, the feedback was extremely positive from school staff. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Does anybody have any questions about that report? Mm -hmm. been busy. Yeah, it's rather lengthy. <laughs> <laughs> Next is the expenditure report. Um, the expenditure report for the end of August is in front of you. Um, any variances between 10% and $10,000 are explained on the um, variance explanation sheet. Uh, I'll be happy to entertain any questions that you might have. Anybody have any questions? No. Okay. Thanks, Robin. Um, we have the second citizen participation public comment. I, I would like to make Okay, please come forward and state your name, please. I'm Karen Fields. I'm president of the Queen Anne County Education Association. Um, I noted, um, Mrs. Harper, you seem to have some frustration with the negotiation process. Um, Mrs. Harper. Ms. Fields, you know we're not allowed to talk I'm about I'm not contracts. talking about specifics, but there is frustration on our end, too. Um, we've been bargaining in good faith. I feel in August we've been spinning our wheels. We have just a few issues that maybe we need to come to an agreement in. But having teachers wait until October 15th for another answer, I don't think is fair. Because we're in school, we're working as hard as we can, and we don't want to be taken for granted. So I hope that we can actually have a dialogue, come to some sort of an agreement, and move on. Because we're, we'll be going into interim report cards before you meet again. And that's just not a tenable situation. I just wanted to express that on behalf of the people that are bargaining in good faith. Thank you, Thank Ms. You. Fields. Anybody else would like to make a comment? No? Nope. Okay, we have the upcoming meetings and events. The MABE co annual conference is October 5th to the 7th, and the 26th annual gala awards banquet at Martins West for Tamara Forte, the Churchill nominated for the state finalist. Which is on the 7th that night. Okay. And just a little sidebar, um, Captain Kelly has been elected to the board of directors for MABE. Oh. I don't know if anybody oh. knew that. Good job there. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Um, and in response to that one, speaking of good things, um, I think that the public should know that um, Dr. Williamson uh, was selected as the chief academic officer for the state of Maryland. Um, you have the state superintendent, and then she has three deputies below her. One that is the Office of School Effectiveness, which is the chief performance officer. Then there's the Deputy for Finance and Admin, which is the Chief Operating Officer. And then there's the Office of Teaching and Learning Deputy, who's the Chief Academic Officer, and that who's, is who Dr. Williamson was selected to be. So she's very high ranking in the state now, and she will be working with all the school systems on the curriculum, it, in particular the curriculum and coming down with curriculum things. So it's a huge feather in her cap, and I think the public should know about that. And congratulations to her. Yes, thank you. 
Okay, at this time, can I have a motion to adjourn? So oh, moved. I'm just asking questions. Oh, I'm sorry. No. It's okay. Out now. okay. Um, I have a motion. Um, do I have a second? Second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Um, any questions or comments regarding the motion? Hearing none, I call for a motion to close open se session. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Good night and thank you for attending. <laughs>